Okay, hi. Welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, where we celebrate the writings of the greatest adventure writer of the 20th century. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books on uh, pre-digital pop culture, such as the pulp magazines that Burroughs' stories were published in. Um, and I have a website uh, uh, about subjects like that as well. Um, and joining me are my uh, bevy of Burroughs buddies, um, Jess and Scott. You guys want to introduce yourselves, Jess? Well, thank you. My name is Jess Terrell, and you all might know me from the Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs, where we talk ERB, Burroughs, all his characters, his worlds, his stories. We talk that pretty near 24-7 for the love of all things Edgar Rice Burroughs on Facebook. And I'm Scott Stewart, and I'm current uh, official editor for Herb Appa, which is ERB, Edgar Rice Burroughs, APA, Amateur Press Association, and uh, having a lot of fun with that and, and uh, really getting a, we had a Mangani here in Central California gathering last week. So got to catch up with some of the members there and, and uh, meet some new friends and, and uh, other people who are ERB, uh, offish, offish, yeah, friendly to ERB. <laughs> Officially <laughs> autos. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, so, okay, and today we are going to be talking about Burroughs' 1934 novel, The Swords of Mars. Uh, but before that... <laughs> yes, I hear the apes of Kershack telling us we have a special feature. We have this episode's trivia content, con question. And uh, the way this is going to work, in a, in a moment I'm going to ask you a trivia question. Um, you, if you send the correct answer to Edgar's mailbag at gmail.com, and that email will be in the show notes, so it'll be there, then uh, we will randomly pick from all the correct answers we get, and the winner will win a copy of Tarzan and the Lion Man, the new authorized library edition of it that has the breathtakingly good Joe Gisco cover on it. Um, every edition from that library, by the way, has a breathtakingly good Joe Gisco uh, the guy's uh, responsible for respiratory problems amongst Burroughs fans, I think, with how good these covers are. Uh, but this one is Tarzan and the Lion Man. It's got a great cover. It's a great story. You will receive a copy of that book if you send us a correct answer to this trivia question at the Edgar Mailbag uh, email address. If you post it on social media uh, where we post this podcast or anyplace else, it doesn't count. It's got to come to the Gmail. Um and so here is the question. During World War II, Edgar Rice Burroughs became the oldest correspondent covering the South Pacific Theater. What newspaper did he write for during this time? So once again, the trivia question. During World War II, Edgar Rice Burroughs became the oldest correspondent covering the South Pacific Theater. What newspaper did he write for during that time? If you know the answer, email it to edgarsmailbag at gmail.com. And you will be in the running to to earn to win a copy of the latest authorized edition of Tarzan and the Lion Man. And that's it for our special feature today. Uh, we are going to be talking about Swords of Mars, which was first uh, uh, printed and published in six issues of Blue Book magazine starting in November of 1934. Um, <laughs> The one little trivia part about the Blue Book uh, appearances of this, that the, that November 1934 uh, uh, cover was supposed to be an image of Edgar Rice Burroughs meeting John Carter outside his cabin in the woods, as is described in the prologue of the book. The artist, the poor man, apparently was not told who John Carter was beyond that he was a swashbuckler type character. So the image we get is somebody in what's pretty much a pirate costume. Um, an ornate pirate costume, which is not how they dress on Mars at all. So it is, as far as I know, the only cover appearance of Edgar Rice Burroughs, who was in the foreground of that cover painting. But the guy he's confronting is um, just a weird John Carter imposter who, it's the worst cosplay costume ever done. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, but the story inside is pretty good. Um, one other bit of trivia before we dive into the book. Um, the, at this time when he was writing it, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs was getting a divorce from his first wife, Emma, and he was in love with a woman named Florence, who he would be marrying, um, short, you know, not long before long. And if you take 
the first letter of the first line of the prologue and of each chapter. It's an acrostic that spells out to Florence, all my love of Ed. So that dedication to this uh, novel is an acrostic that spread across the first that spread across the first letter of each chapter throughout the book, dedicating it to his soon to be wife, Florence, um, which I thought was actually pretty clever. So we are going to begin talking about the book uh, just to give credit where credit is due. We, we have all read the book again and made our own notes, but to make sure we don't miss anything when we're summarizing it, I always refer to the uh, Egger, the ERB summary project, which you can find on erblist.com. They have all of they have chapter by chapter summaries of all of Burroughs's novels, and they're extremely helpful to us. And Swords of Mars was summarized by David Arthur Adams. So when I'm giving a chapter summary as we go along, I'm going to be referring and probably occasionally paraphrasing or even directly quoting from that excellent summary. And so we are ready, I think, to dive into the book. Any comments from you guys before we do? Well, one thing I would like to point out here, and I'm saying a little prematurely, but I want to be sure I, I mention it because I think it's a worthwhile point. Mm -hmm. um, as I've often stated, Burroughs uh, gives us some well-meaning and good, I think, life lessons, such as uh, being conducting yourself as a gentleman, uh, being fair, uh, standing up for what's right, um, th th those kinds of things. Um, oh, get, getting getting outside, getting some exercise, appreciating nature. Uh, mm -hmm. th there's some more on that list. Uh, another thing that he's teaching us kind of, I think, uh, indirectly is uh, for for those of us who are, who are looking for companionship, hanging out in bars trying to pick up a girl is generally just doesn't work. Um, but what Burles is teaching us here is get yourself a sword. And go off and rescue damsels in distress. In in our example in this story here, you will see that John Carter uh, has two uh, young ladies who are interested in him. We hear about that, and and he even even picks up a pad while he was going going to dis, uh, dispose of, um, and uh, and then there's of course Dej Thoris uh, kidnapped someplace in the corner. So um, the, the, I would recommend getting yourself a sword and 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 say go out there and save those damsels. All right, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of the useful life skills uh, you learn from John Carter in Tarzan is get yourself a bladed weapon and learn how to kill people. Then exactly. you'll be in good place, you'll be in good shape. So, and, and I, I'd, I'd like to jump in with a comment too. Uh, um, uh, uh, I tend to, in my memory, <laughs> think uh, I've, I've read all the ERB books, but along the lines, there are ones I, I have so I haven't read. Uh, a, um, some of the romance novels and i don't believe i ever got this volume into my head mm. uh for a long time i considered chessmen of mars possibly me, me my john carter favorite i'm replacing that with this one swords of mars i found it an immensely entertaining fast-paced uh read with a couple storylines never confusing Mm. but it, it was not repeated over and over. The adventure continues as the uh, listeners will hear from us here uh, uh, from Barzoom and uh, to the moon, uh, uh, their moon and one of their moons and back and uh, through uh, uh, rebuilt cities and, and the mm. capital and just all over the place, but very orderly and tons and tons of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's been years since I read this one, and I didn't have a really strong memory of it because I've read so much Burroughs in between. But I loved it too. Um, um, I, it, it's and for all the reasons you just said, uh, and we'll be of course visiting this in detail as we discuss each chapter. But um, yeah, I agree everything you just said. I don't know. I think Chessman is probably still my favorite of mine, but um, this is a great novel. So. But we, the prologue, by the way, is a fun one. It is uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs in a cabin um, in the mountains of Arizona. Um, so he is just on vacation reading a pulp magazine gangster story, which I think is when we when we are dis uh, discussing this in a moment, I'm going to bring that up again because I think it actually has some thematic importance. Um, and uh, uh, John Carter shows up 
And, you know, he's has now a way of tell a never explained way of teleporting back and forth between Earth and Mars. He only occasionally comes to Earth because he considers Mars his home. Mm -hmm. But he's he's back to visit his favorite nephew and to recount one of his latest adventures, uh, which Burroughs then writes down and publishes in uh, Blue Book magazine. So. Um, um, and the, um, he. In chapter one, I'm going to do the, describe the prologue in chapter one together, and then we'll do them chapter by chapter. Um, he tells us, but John Carter reminds us of the Bar Barsoomian city of Zodanga, which was a, which he once raised to the ground in a war, has a powerful guild of assassins. And Carter is John Carter has been trying to get rid of the assassins guilds for years, but they are like uh, kind of the Sicilian mafia. You know, you just can never quite stamp them out. But he's taken to doing some sort of vigilante justice. He will find an assassin and or one of his guys will find an assassin and kill him and put a little X over their heart to show that this guy was 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 killed because he was an assassin and killed by John Carter and his crew. Um, so he goes there in disguise to try and find the Zodagan uh, assassins. He takes a room at a public house where he meets Rapus the Ulcio, which is Barsoomian for rat. Uh, and boy, the guy lives up to this name over the course of the story. He, uh, John Carter introduces himself as a mercenary, a panthon called Vandar. And uh, Rappus reveals that he's a Gorthon, a freelance assassin outside the guild. And he invites Rapp uh, Rappus invites John Carter to meet his boss, a scientist named Val Ooh. Civis. That is the prologue and the first two chapters. What I wanted to say about the gangster story that... Um, uh, John, the Burroughs's writing uh, reading is that I think Burroughs is making a point about how we enjoy adventure stories, and it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, as long as they're internally consistent stories that tell the story well. You know, it can be a gangster story, and now John Carter's telling a story kind of about Martian gangsters uh, with the assassin guilds. So, you know, the, these stories of danger and adventure always intrigue us, whether they're gangster stories, science fiction stories. Jungle adventure stories, what have you. A good adventure story will always have an appeal. Uh, but any comments from you guys about the, the prologue in chapter one? Well, if I, if I can jump in, I may be a little early again, but the um, Rappus, the Ulcio, mm -hmm. the rat. Mm -hmm. That nickname, the rat, and, and Ulcio is a, is a Barsoom name for, for rat. Um, that nickname immediately gives us a mental image of what mm -hmm. the guy might look like and certainly a, a mental idea of what his behavior is. Uh, I distinctly recall, oh, gee whiz, uh, one of the one of the movie actors' uh, name escapes me, but the favorite phrase there was, you dirty rat. Mm -hmm. and he James was the rat. Thank you. Yeah. And generally, <laughs> he, he was the rat in the story. Mm -hmm. But uh, that word has some significance to it and uh, immediately gives us some idea of what this person is about and what he looks like. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say, like, it's not, on you know, once again, Burroughs was reading a gangster story. It's not unusual for gangsters in fiction, at least, to have, you know, nicknames, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ice, Ice Box Eddie or, you know, or John, you know, Ralph the Rat or whatever. So it's <laughs> it, once again, I think he's paralleling that this is in some ways this is a gangster story set on Mars. So Scott. Yeah, Tom, there's a definite, know, definite mm -hmm. parallel to that. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, any other comments or should I jump into chapter two? Uh, real quick, um, I won't go over the stuff you talked about him mm -hmm. uh, meeting the uh, uh, rappers and stuff, but I really, uh, it's only a paragraph, maybe two paragraphs. I really liked his narrative, his description of uh, uh, John Carter in his craft going over the planet's surface and uh, uh, the way he uh, uh, illustrates in his words the appearance of a uh, theory are the uh, moon and the other moon up in the sky and the difference in their sizes and mm -hmm. and uh, the idea like you know say our moon was only 5,000 miles away instead of 50 you know what is it 50 million or, or whatever uh, two, but, uh, 200, 250,000 about I think 250,000 thank you uh, um, but the way he describes of course you know, you know physics and science coming and playing we couldn't we couldn't have the moon that close to us, but mm -hmm. since this moon is only what something like seven miles, or mm -hmm. it's a very small moon, and the idea of that appearance floating, orbiting over the sky about three times a day, or 
because uh, of the size and speed is, is very, uh, uh, I thought, very cool. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, actually makes me, I'm sorry, Jess, it makes me think of something that I think should have been obvious. I didn't think about it. Often he mentions the two moons at the beginning of a Barsoom story in order to help establish this is an alien world. He does that here, but it has a double purpose. He's also foreshadowing that one of those moons, at least, is going to play an important part in the story. Yeah. Um, the, the point, and it also will tell us if it's night or day, if he's talking mm -hmm. about generally. Yeah. Um, the point I wanted, wanted, wanted to make, um, and it almost slipped my mind, Theria. <clears throat> um, the word Theria appears twice in the in the um, Edgar Rice Burroughs glossary. Mm -hmm. And that is, we have Theria here, Theria here on Barsoom, one of the moons, as you just stated. And there's also a um, place in Pellucidor called Theria. And that's that's not coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, and also note that um, the size differential is um, compensated for. There's some kind of a mechanism mm -hmm. that, uh, shall we say, uh, shrinks people. I'm not going to say it's what the ant men use, but it, it does bring people down to size, literally, to fit properly over on Theria. On Theria, mm -hmm. the moon on Barsoom, and there's a similar thing with the Theria over in Pellucidor. And that is explored in the uh, current um, oh heck, co rocket the Earth's core is where that comes up. Okay. A brand new book that's, from uh, Wynn Scott Eckert. That's neat. I actually uh, had forgotten about Theria being in Pellucidor, so that's a neat connection there. Um, okay. and, um, yeah, I should say like the, I guess we'll get to it when it talked about the effect of, of shrinking down when you fly to Thuria is, is, is explained, not a mechanism like the Ant-Man, not an artificial thing, but apparently it's a natural, there's some sort of weird connection between Mars and Thuria that makes that happen naturally when you fly back and forth between the two, uh, the two, uh, satellites. So, um, so it's yeah, and of course it's not explained because it's total science fiction, and that's not a criticism of it. It's 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 a cool, it's a cool element to this book. But um, it, it, it could be as simple, and I'm using the word yeah. simple loosely mm -hmm. here, but it could mm -hmm. be as simple as passing through some kind of a dimensional uh, doorway. Yeah, it could, and that's something to think about. Now that the extended universe books have introduced multiple realities. You know, to explain things is why don't we see Barsoom when we look at Mars now? Why, why didn't the Mars rover find a green Martian? You know, so they used multiple reality, parallel dimensions to explain that. So he, so you could be passing through some sort of dimensional door. He, he also probably needed a device somehow with mm -hmm. putting a story together, because with the population that's up there in the palaces, cities and landscape uh, with an area that'd be so small that everyone would be basically face to face with that population and very mm -hmm. little room for buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you shrink in, the, uh, in proportion to that, it now becomes uh, the moon becomes the size of a planet for people uh, that would be more like earth or, yeah. or like Mars. You have much more, if you're only nine inches tall, then, you know, seven miles, is a whole lot different than if you're six feet tall. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. It gives him the opportunity to build a real, uh, 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 a detailed world there. He does quite a bit of world building here uh, when mm -hmm. we get to Thuria, very quickly and very effectively. So, um, so yeah, but um, it's, it's possible that it is a dimensional door, that the Thuria they end up on is actually in a different dimension from Barsoom. So, um, you know, it's one way of explaining it that's actually kind of cool. So sort of like the old line that was repeated in Animal House. Mm -hmm. So there might be a universe within a universe within a universe. <laughs> wow, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I got to revisit that movie. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not PC anymore. Mm -hmm. Of course, it wasn't then either. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> okay. Um well, chapter two, which is titled Foul Civis, the name of the um, the mad scientist who's a main character in this novel and would, as we covered in our last past, uh, podcast, would be reused as a main villain in um, in um, uh, uh, William Patrick Murray's Tarzan Back to Mars novel. Uh, so Carter, had, remember, posing as Vandar, a panthon, which means a mercenary. You know, he, John Carter meets Val Civis and 
They uh, Val Cal Civis, Fal Civis, F A L S I V A S. I think I have a tendency to pronounce his first first name as like it's a V, but that's incorrect. Uh, so if I say Val Civis, I'm just wrong. So um, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Carter and Rappus duel, and Rappus is just basically made a fool of because John Carter is so much better. Um, and we find out that Val Fal Civis. Um, reveals he's an inventor and he's threatened by another inventor who's employed an agent of the Assassin's Guild, which is headed by a man named Ur Jam to, to kill him. So you've got uh, Falcivus hiring a um, independent assassin uh, named Rappus and then the this rival scientist going to the guild headed by Earth Jan to hire a, a guild assassin to do a him in. So John Carter becomes a personal bodyguard, and he's given a room. Um, his real mission is to overthrow Urjan, the guild. But he's, uh, you know, but you know, the situation has placed him outside the guild rather than in it. And he meets a slave girl, Xanda, who's threatened by Val by Fal Civis. Um, <laughs> you know, he learns that um, Fal Civis steals the inventions of others, and then he has the, those inventors murdered. And one of those uh, inventions is a interplanetary spaceship, and another is a mechanical brain. I think if this was written a few years later, uh, he would have just said computer. But although the word yeah. the word computer was a part of the English language at that time, but it was usually referred to somebody who could just do math really quick. It wasn't. It, was, it became common to refer to it as a actual machine uh, during the 1940s. So. Um, a preliminary uh, so, to AI. Yeah, preliminary AI. And we're going to get to that in one chapter about how their concerns about the mechanical brain reflect AI, current AI concerns so perfectly. But uh, he's perfecting this brain by experimenting on the living brains of his slaves. So uh, John Carter hides Xanda out so she's not grabbed for to have basically her brain dissected by, by foul civis. Um, so that's chapter two. Um, I think... Uh, you know, uh, Burroughs is very, very effective in quickly establishing the personalities of Rappus and of uh, Fal Civis. Uh, he uses Xanda as an effective source of exposition. She's able to pass on information. It's completely believable that she would have this information. So Burroughs is, is um, giving us the information we need to be able to understand the story very quickly and very effectively. Um, and I also like that John Carter immediately offering to help Xanda reminds him of his chivalry and that counterpoints the pure evil of the bad guys around him quite effectively. You know, they're willing to murder women or experiment on women. John Carter immediately jumps in to protect a woman in danger without even thinking about it or thinking about, wait a minute, does this fit into my mission or not? That's not a concern. The only concern he has is here's a woman in danger. I got to help her. So comments from you guys. Well, one thing I want, I wanted to point out, uh, it is, in the real world, it's, of course, we're talking fiction here. I know that. Mm -hmm. In the real world, though, it's just a little unusual that the the head of the corporation, or the um, or the president of the state, uh, president of the state, president of the country, or or the warlord of the of the world, goes off and and, and takes a mission and does the mission himself. Usually, he has people he assigns that kind of thing to. But John Carter's a hands on guy. Mm -hmm. And besides, reading a story about him sitting behind a desk directing traffic policy. <laughs> is very interesting. So he, so he's he's out there in, in the field getting his feet wet and getting getting the business. I just wanted to point out uh, that that's not the way it works. The real uh, world I like this mm -hmm. way better. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it does. It does on Star Trek because mm -hmm. the captain of the ship would never leave on all these dangerous missions. He'd wait for the information to be collected. Yeah, well, it just <laughs> just made me think. Like and Star Trek's real. Yeah. Next <laughs> next month, the new Barsoomian novel, Bureaucracy on Mars. <laughs> like, uh, I, but also, also i should say that john carter mentions he has a hard time recruiting people to take out the assassins because the assassins are so yeah. powerful it reminds me again of what the mafia was like in the al capone days you know it's like can't we go against these guys no they're too powerful they're just going to kill you you know the the cops are on their side there's nothing you can do uh it's the same kind of feeling here it's should, these assassins are back shouldn't we take them out Nope, uh, they're just too powerful. We're scared. So even on Mars, a Barsoom, where everybody is mind-numbingly brave and likes a good fight, no one wants to take on the assassins. 
So that kind of helps establish that John Carter has to do it himself. And I agree, he's a hands-on guy. That's the main reason. But also he couldn't find people to do it for him anyway, because they're all scared. So, uh, you know, John Carter's got to step up and be the ma massive hero he is in order to get this stuff done. Well, all the, all the Burroughs heroes are men of action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, albeit, even even uh, the ones who have the street smarts, they, they, they do it in an intelligent way. Mm -hmm. They're not throwing themselves out to be, you know, uh, bluster into combat and just get killed right in the thing. They mm -hmm. do it in a, uh, a well-planned approach, but they're, they're men of action. If yeah. the uh, bureaucracy of Mars mm -hmm. is holding things up, mm -hmm. he's going to go in there and say, we, we need to get this taken care of now. Yeah. And, and also the Martian culture is kind of like when medieval kings had to lead their armies from the front. You know, it's not necessarily the most practical thing. They should be in the back directing you know, directing everything more intelligently. But it's like no one on Mars is going to follow a leader who doesn't step in front of the army and and yeah. and, and take on the danger himself. It's just not Actually, part of their culture. That's that's really a very good point. Mm -hmm. the, you, you, you set that, you, it's an example mm -hmm. that you're following, that you expect other people to, to follow behind you. Yeah. And, and exercise that same example is a word for it. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's the old saying that I was going to point out uh, after I thought about it, uh, if you want something done, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this and, was and a that, case. <laughs> that, that, this that draws a parallel here in Earth history. Whether you care for the man or don't, whatever you know about George Armstrong Custer, mm -hmm. he became the uh, youngest uh, appointed general in the Civil War due to the fact, I think he was, what, 22, 23? Mm -hmm. Due to the fact that he would lead the charge with his men. And uh, the men he worked with were very loyal to the fact that he would put himself in harm's way right with them. That's what they used to call Custer's luck. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately for him, his uh, luck and um, <laughs> a few <laughs> other questionable errors ended for him at that little uh, battle of Little Bighorn. But that's where his reputation started during the Civil War and doing that and why he had men below him at that time who uh, were thoroughly... Uh, loyal to uh, what he was doing in ba um, bat it, in, in battle i'm sorry combat and battle um yeah so you can find earth real life examples of this of leading from the front but in on mars much like it was in medieval europe the leaders had to lead from the front in order to keep the respect of the people they were leading yeah so um um you know nowadays no one's gonna no one unless they just have or disconnected from reality no one's going to blame a general for being behind the lines where he can get the information on everything and direct the battle intelligently which is what yeah, he should nowadays, be nowadays a lot of troops are halfway around the world running it by yeah computer. Mm -hmm. yeah so um you know you you got to be where you got to be but for with on martian in martian culture if you're going to be a leader then you got to be out front in front of everybody else with your sword yes. out so um, um, and and the same with Dejah Thoris and and uh, in other women they uh, he he presents here they're they're mm -hmm. uh, people of action mm -hmm. you know uh, she throw herself right into battle uh, uh, with the warlord or or even before they met when she's in the flying ships and uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, she's a warrior herself yeah um, yeah I think we get good examples here here of just how strong and capable. Burroughs as women are, they often need to be rescued, but they're not helpless damsels in distress. In distress. Then I've got a question for you guys concerning the uh, book we re, uh, reviewed the last time, the uh, Tarzan on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, where do you place that book and this one in a timeline? Well, this is obviously the Back to Mars is actually is obviously after um, uh, this one, and that's. Uh, that's yeah. what I was thinking too. Yeah, yeah. I think I think but, he actually I think John Carter in the in the in Murray's book actually says, "Whoop! I've run out into this guy before, and he disappeared afterwards, and now he's yeah. popped up with these bad guys still building an interplanetary ship with a mechanical brain." So he was because I'm I'm stuff. alluding I'll allude to the uh, passage Burroughs wrote here where uh, mm -hmm. uh, Carter did not want to uh, necessarily draw a sword against uh, uh, Rappus. Because if he drew his sword, it was to kill. But mm -hmm. as we know, twice he's been in a, a friendly 
<laughs> Friendly deals with Tarzan. With the yeah. Tarzan. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a fun to kind of not necessarily contradiction, but uh, mm. the place of it. So maybe, you know. Well, if and he also had the duel to learn how to be a swordsman. Yeah. And, he, and he, has to, he has to practice. I mean, there's got to be yeah. times where he just, Cantos Can comes over and says, let's go at it in a friendly, yeah. you know, with blunted swords or whatever to keep in practice. There's, you know, because. And, and then we've also discussed in some other books, Burroughs usually uh, brings in a sense of threat mm -hmm. and and to keep the story moving and in danger. Uh, but every once in a while, and we've talked about a couple scenes in other books, like this one, with the idea of having your skull removed and being conscious in the person mm -hmm. testing you, operating and observing your brain and that, the pain in that. Some scenes he can write are absolutely bone chilling if you stop to think about what he is really saying here. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Yep. Um, okay, well, let's move to chapter three. Um, so, Val, I keep saying Foul Civis. I'll, I'll get it right by the end of the podcast. Foul Civis comes to John Carter's room. Uh, Carter's reading a book, a scientific text. So, Val Civis begins to wonder if maybe John Carter can be his assistant. And he reveals the name of his rival scientist, Gar, Gar now will be meeting him later on. Um, and, uh, you know, John Carter says, well, I'll go spy on Earth and the head of the Assassin's Guild tomorrow evening. Um, for To keep Xanda safe, she spends the night in John Carter's room, but she sleeps in the other room, of course, uh, yeah. because uh, I don't think it would ever occur to John Carter to try and cheat on Deja, Th Deja Thoris. He knows he has it good there. He's never going to be that dumb. Uh, but, uh, you know, so he plan. you know, Fal Civis promised him a slave, so he plans to choose her in order to keep her safe. Um, in the morning, uh, that next morning, there's two armed men in the co at the common uh, mess area. You know, one is Hamas, the, the major, who's like the major domo, the kind of overseer of the place, and the other is Fistal, who's in charge of the slaves. And um, when Xanda arrives, in order to explain where she was for the night, she she's very quick thinking. She pretends that she spent the night with ha with Hamas, and uh, Carter chooses her as has her slave. And that night, he gets the directions and signals he needs to go to the house of Earth Ann. Um, he lands the he lands his flyer on the roof of the Assassins Guild, and he climbs down a wall to an open will uh, op open window. And he hears some voices in the room um, where, you know, and he's hoping to learn secrets, uh, you know, hear what they're saying. But while he's at the at the window, he hears footsteps approaching down the corridor. So it seems like he might be stuck between two sets of bad guys. That's the cliffhanger ending of this. Um, I will once again, I'll say that Xanda approves to be proves to be the sort of intelligent and brave woman that Burroughs normally writes, you know, her trick and claiming to be with Hamas all night and him uh, being, you know, uh, just, it was clever and it was quick thinking. Um, and it, it uh, kept her from getting John Carter into trouble and um, with, you know, you instantly like her at this point, she's not just in desperate danger. She's like helping herself where she can as well. Yeah, that scene cracked me up. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know it was funny because um, Hamas is stammering and uh, denying it, and a little bit oh, for a Burroughs novel, almost risque that she was claiming to spend the night with a guy. Um, but mm -hmm. you can't feel sorry for Hamas; he's he's clearly a jerk right from the get go. Um, well, I have to say, I was I was relieved when I double checked and saw that she did did not stay over in John Carter's room because mm -hmm. I was. I knew that couldn't be the case, but I wanted to just double check anyhow. So yeah, it's case. it's made clear that he's not taking advantage of her because even if she was willing, because she's still a slave at this point, it would just be um even if he weren't married and that barrier didn't exist. It would to take advantage of her in this situation where she has to be there in order to stay safe would just be horrible. It's not mm -hmm. something a gentleman like John Carter would even think about. One of those lessons that Burroughs teaches us. Yes, I agree. Yeah, we treat women with respect. Always, always, always. Um, I also want to say Hamas is uh, that he has the same name as a current uh, terror organization is obviously just a coincidence. Um, yeah. So, so, but 
you know, the the organization Hamas has been in the news a lot recently. I just wanted to point that out. There's no connection there at all. It's just Deca a decades, decades, them. decades between them. Um, there's, you know, uh, both represent villainy, but uh, there's no direct connection there. So it's just a, a coincidence of consonants. So, OK, any other comments on Chapter three? Not for me. OK, well, Chapter four, it's death by night. Um, Carter, you know, he's in the assassin's house, the assassin's guild building. He manages to get behind a cupboard and, uh, before he's discovered and he sees, a, um, you know, a whole bunch of guys seated around a table headed by Earl Jan and Rappus, the rat comes in to tell Earl Jan that a stranger to, to Zodanga, uh, is the man who does the killing for Fal Sil, Sivis. So, He's framing, he comes into the guild and try and wants to frame John Carter in his identity as Vandor uh, for the crimes that the uh, Rapia, that, um, you know, Rappus has been actually doing. So an uh, assassin named Uldak is sent with Rappus to kill uh, John Carter, to kill a guy they think is named Vandor. Uh, Carter memorizes the faces of as many of these guys as he can. Then he leaves and then he follows Uldak and he kills him in a fight. Um, so, um, and then he puts the little X over his heart to show that it was like, this is, you know, a John Carter kill of an assassin. Um, and so it's a, it's a fun chapter. It's got tension in it. It's got a sword fight at the end. It's got John Carter staying one step ahead of the people who are trying to kill him. Um, but, and, but, you know, between Rappus's treachery and Uldak's cheating and cowardness during the fight i think this might be the most loathsome set of bad guys john carter's ever encountered you know usually even martian bad guys have some sense of honor but rapus and the assassins they seem to have none at all they are just total bad guys uh comments from you guys on chapter four uh, a couple things if i may uh back in the days when more people were carrying swords than than guns mm -hmm. a long time ago Perhaps leaving leaving some kind of a mark on your on your opponent might have been a more common practice. But I have to say, when I saw that, that John Carter was was marking these guys with an X, I immediately thought of Zero and the emblem he might leave yeah. on on his opponents. So I wanted to mention that. Well, it's, and, a neat, it's a neat connection. I didn't think of that. And then and then another thing here, I believe this is the Avenue of the Green Throat. Is in this is in we're in chapter four. I think it's mentioned in. Mm -hmm. in chapter four and uh, uh i i was wondering what the heck is a green throat and i double checked it and i thought maybe they were saying green throat and that we had a typo here but mm -hmm. uh, i did not confirm it as a typo so it's green throat whatever that might be the only people with green throats that i know of are the uh, green martians like a, um i don't know uh, maybe it's a street that got renamed after the green martians raised the city to the ground in in well, um in uh princess of mars and, and I those don't, guys are so so tall. You're looking up at them while you see. Uh, so see is their throat. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> that would be an interesting story. How you came up with the avenue of the green throat? Maybe there was a plague once, and your your throat looking green when the doctor looked in on it was one of the one of the symptoms. I'm really stretching here. I have that's a, there's a good uh, there's a story there somewhere as to how this street got its name, but I have no idea what it is. Okay, just asking. Mm -hmm. I just came up with a mysterious sounding name too, but yeah, I I didn't yeah. think about it. I just went by that until you brought that up about is there a history on that? Yeah, I'm gonna take a quick maybe. look off of Google here. But uh, maybe maybe Burroughs intended the right throat, the the Martian animal, um, and wrote throat by accident, and there's no reason for the editor at the, at the Blue Book to catch that, and it just got through. That could be. Maybe uh, let's say Edgar Rice Burroughs misunderstood John Carter when he was writing all this down. <laughs> that's, <laughs> well, that's it right there. Uh, you nailed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the indications here medically of a uh, when you refer to having a green throat means it's a sign of a very serious infection. Okay. So the city is oh. incredibly infected. Well, now that 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 could be that the, thinking about all these assassins, all these bad guys over at Zodanga, that's a serious infection. Yeah, it yeah. could be. It's like, um, so yeah, um, so that's but yeah, I'm looking here even in the summary that I'm looking at to make sure I don't miss any details when I'm giving the summary. 
it has the avenue of the green throat. So uh, no one considers it a typo. So, so who knows? But, um, okay, any other comments on chapter four? No. Okay. Well, chapter five, titled The Brain, uh, John Carter goes to meet Rappus at the eating place where, um, you know, he was supposed to have been assassinated by Oldak. So Rappus is kind of a little freaked out when, when John Carter shows up. Um, the, the, um, you know, they are, they received the news that Uldak has been found dead and that the cross of the warlord was on his heart. Um, so Carter, John Carter goes back to Fal Sivis's house. Um, and he tells Fal Sivis that Earthan knows he has his personal bodyguard. So there must be a leak somewhere. So he's just pretty much playing mind games with the bad guys. Um, Fal Sivis, you know, knows it must be Rappus, so no one else, no, but nobody else has gone out of the house. So he orders Carter to kill to kill Rappus. Um, Fal also decides to trust John Carter, and he shows him his interplanetary spaceship, which is controlled by the mechanical brain linked to his own. So he can telepathically tell the ship what to do, and the ship will do it. Um, you know, so he just um, claims that this invention just he kind of tries to justify himself how ruthless he's become that this invention has cost him all his human instinct so now he's a creature of just cold formulas you know and he's not able to feel and feel anything um so that kind of he's trying to explain away his own villainy and we'll find out soon when we find out just how he tortures people in those brain experiments just how far into villainy he's fallen um so, but it's kind of interesting that Fal Civis is self-aware that he's done all these horrible things, but he still does them anyway. Um, you know, usually villains think they're the heroes in their stories, but here Fal Civis knows he does horrible things and he just says, yeah, what the heck, um, I'm getting my job done. So um, any comments from you guys on this chapter? I, I just have a throwback on the last one there. Mm -hmm. Went out to ERB list, uh, mm -hmm. a, a Barsoomian uh, guide or directory, mm -hmm. and they mentioned Avenue of the Green Throat, but basically just what we talked about, a street of Zodanga where Vandor dueled with Aldak. Okay. So uh, in one way, I guess if you want, you could say it's also the street of death. You know, yeah. yeah. Green Throat is a sign of sickness or illness or infection, and dueling and with the assassins and on there, it might be a... Uh, uh, if you want to call it a, uh, a poetical type name of a street of death or alley of death yeah. or something. Yeah, but doesn't that mean that like at some point when they're naming streets, someone said, I have a feeling there's going to be a duel to the death in this street one way. Let's <laughs> name it Green Throat. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 there might, or there might be a duel out there every night. <laughs> well, it's Mars. You can name yeah. any street the, the street of death yeah. and someone's yeah. going to have a duel on it sooner or later. It's what they do. So <laughs> we can't, we can't fight our duel here. This is the street of happiness. We gotta go <laughs> over there's the street of death. We gotta go over there and do this. Maybe, yeah, maybe, be, maybe they do probably that. Be on... pronounced differently in helium because it would be street of death. <laughs> maybe the every neighborhood in every Martian city has a street of death, street of green throat, whatever. So that's where people go to duel, and it's easier to collect the bodies in the morning. <laughs> well, so. I mean, look here. Look here. <laughs> Actually, look at the United States. Traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, for, for for traditionally for towns or cities that were built on with a riverfront. Okay, mm -hmm. you you would you would have uh, there would be a not luggage. There would be a uh, stuff would be coming in by boat, shipped shipped in there by boat. Okay, and it would go in the warehouse. The warehouse is on Main Street, and and then and then you might have a Market Street where where all the people would sell their fruits and cabbages and vegetables and those kinds of things, and then. Uh, two or three blocks up the road, you've got Broadway where all the businesses are and, and the corporate headquarters and, and and those kinds of things. That 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 basic layout uh, is was fairly standard in the U.S. for years. It's still yeah. it's still there. Oh, the, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, I'm back in chapter four still. Um, the, the, the cupboard. Why do why does a house of bad guys have a cupboard? Is this for tea? What are they using this thing? Well, I mean, you still need a place to keep your dishes and such, where they're out of the way when you're not using them. They probably had slaves to to cook and serve the meals. Okay, so, yeah. So, you, so why there would be a yeah? If that's their usual meeting room, actually, it, I think it probably kind of makes sense. There's a cupboard with utensils and dishes and such near that room. 
Well, I just wanted to pay a compliment to John Carter for looking behind the cupboard because if I was <laughs> in a house like that, I'd be checking behind the cupboard too because that's where mm. I would expect secret opening to be. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's enough for me. I'm I'm done with chapter four. Okay. I'm sorry to throw us back to that chapter too, but mm. I just thought it was interesting. Well, I was going to mm. go there anyhow, so no need so, to apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah, this is fun stuff. Um, but in in our summary, we're up to uh, um, chapter uh, six. Um, you know, uh, where there's still uh, Car John Carter is still inspecting the interplanetary inter ship with with Fal Silvis. He realizes that Fal Silvis is like a Jekyll and Hyde type character. I think he actually uses that term in the story, doesn't he? So he's occasionally been yeah. reading books when he comes back to when he comes back to um, uh, Earth. So. Um, you know, so there's, you know, um, so we get an idea because this ship's going to be important. So we get more detail about the ship here. And the, um, the you know, he makes, uh, Carter ha helps Val Civis improve the motor gearing. Um, and that's kind of a throwback to the very first book where Cantos Can taught John Carter how to mess with the with the gearing of flying vehicles to make them a little faster. Um they establish that there's radium rifles on board and cameras and all the stuff that's going to like be a part of the story later on. Um, there's also he, John Carter sees that there's people who are basically zombies chained to their benches doing uh, um, work on the on electrical components and such. And these are like all that's left of these people after their brains were experimented on. Um, so when John Carter returns to his quarter, Xander warns him that Hamas fears that John Carter is usurping his authority and he hates him for it. And Val Sivis tells John Carter not to leave the house um, after he's learned about the secrets of the ship because he doesn't, he wants to make extra sure nobody else learns about a ship. But Carter actually goes back to the lab and he discovers he can control the ship telepathically. Uh, um, but then Val Sivis comes in while he's just finishing up this. So the chapter ends with a nice cliffhanger. That did Fal Civis see John Carter mentally controlling the ship. Um, and he also builds up tension by presenting Hamas as a threat and by making Carter a de facto prisoner in the in the in the um in the house. So any comments from you guys on chapter six? Well, I was gonna point out that's where there's a reference there by Burroughs to Jekyll and Hyde, and mm -hmm. it's a little unusual for him to call out characters from other writers. Mm -hmm. And then you also mentioned zombies, which I reckon might be considered a uh, a reference to someone's character, some zombie character. And there's also a mention of Frankenstein later in this book somewhere. Well, Frankenstein was written in the early 19th century, so he would have been familiar with that before his original trip to Mars. Um, Jekyll and Hyde was written in 1886. So mm -hmm. he he's transported to Mars within a year or two after the Civil War ends like late 1860s um, and is there for 10 years and then comes back for at least 10 years before he supposedly uh, dies again. Right. Am I remembering right. this time? Right. I think you're right. I think you're right. But I will, I will add to that. It is possible that in addition to crossing the void of space through something that is akin to what I would call astral projection, that he could have passed through a, he, John Carter could have passed through a time barrier meaning he could have gone back in time or forward in time. I think most mm -hmm. likely back in time uh, if he if well, he get there in current time. The way the time works out, though, it's possible that Jekyll and Hyde was published just before he gets back to Mars uh, at the beginning of Gods of Mars. So he could he, he could have had a chance just to read it while he was just living uh, life on Earth, trying to, you know, one day get back to Mars. So I, I thought it was interesting that he mentioned it. I mean, it fits. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good comparison. It's a very practical uh, comparison to use, actually. Yeah. It's just it's kind of a, a, just a little unusual for him. Yeah. Anyways, maybe he still uh, likes, even though he obviously prefers Mars, maybe he still likes Earth literature. And one of the reasons he comes back is to pick up some books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I, I thought, I thought too, that I might have find, found a, a timeline mark here by mm -hmm. the publication in 86. Mm -hmm. But then rereading that first paragraph, um, I'm not entirely sure. It not might not be uh, ERB's 
own observation about people. And so it wouldn't have mattered when it was written. Okay, so Burroughs might have put in the Jekyll and Hyde thing when he was writing down John Carter's story. Yeah, it's very subtle. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it is, because it could be John Carter telling the story too, or it could be ERB uh, interjecting in yeah. his own, because he said he's trying to tell the story in the words as he best mm -hmm. remembers. Yeah, another possibility. Oh, oh go ahead, Jess. Uh, sorry, I was simply going to say, you got you. Uh, John Carter is simply relating the facts as he recalls them. Uh, he knows Burroughs is a writer, so he would probably expect Burroughs to embellish or to use his own wording mm. where Burroughs thinks is appropriate. Yeah. So also, I just wonder if the Gridley wave could be used to transport, uh, to tell it to uh, transmit movies, and maybe there's a Martian streaming service on the Gridley wave, and he's seen the movie version of Jekyll and Hyde. No, so. that's a good idea. <laughs> so... So, um, yeah, now we have to wonder what the people on Barsoom thought of the 19, 2012 John Carter movie. So, I hope nobody's seen them soap operas. <laughs> okay, uh, we are up to chapter seven, right? Uh, the face in the doorway. So, uh, you know, we left with that, we ended with that little cliffhanger. Did Fal Siva see him, see John Carter controlling the ship? But apparently he he got the ship back down to the floor just in time. Um, but he actually looks like he might be suspicious. Maybe he just like came in at the very last second and maybe thought he saw it moving. So he asked Carter to try and move it. And Carter just fakes not being able to move it. He thinks of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair instead. Um, and... Um, I looked that up because he mentions the uh, Congress of Women. So yeah. apparently there was like a Miss Universe contest of sorts at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So um, I know John Carter is completely loyal to Deja Thoris. I'm not questioning that, but apparently he distracts himself telepathically so he can't control by thinking of pretty girls he saw at that World's Fair. Um, that'd be interesting to hit 1893 into the timeline too wouldn't he have been back on mars by then so so yeah so he, if, if he's remembering that expedition uh, exposition he definitely could remember uh robert lewis stevenson yeah but um i'm just trying to think i don't know if anybody's ever done a detailed timeline you know he goes to mars in 1867 comes back in 1877 goes back in 1890s so uh, just see, I don't know if he should have been on Earth in 1893. I'm not sure of the timeline there. So, but it gives you it gives you clues that make a timeline possible, though, doesn't it? I, I, someone must have put together a timeline at some point. Might be a Danger good Thoris article might, for Herb Apple. Yeah, it would be. So, Danger Thoris might be asking where he was. So long. <laughs> well, when he recounts this to Deja Thoris, um, he's going to tell. Oh, I was thinking of you, honey. Of course. So, um, uh, so you know, anyway, we just find out Val Civis amps up the stakes quite a bit. He talks about, like, how one day he can create a mechanical army controlled by his thoughts alone, and he can conquer the world, and he plans to go to Thuria, and ha he thinks it has mountains of gold and, uh, and platinum, and he's going to get all the treasure he needs to build, basically, a, a robot army and, and capture all of Barsoom. So... John Carter came here to take care of the Assassin's Guild, but now he's getting into, whoops, I've got to stop this mad scientist from one day conquering the world. So he's, he's got several sets of bad guys he has to um, deal with. Um, but in this chapter, it ends when he finally gets permission to leave the house. He meets up with Rappus again. He learns that Urjan suspects that the warlord is in Zodanga. He still doesn't know that John Carter as Vandor is the warlord. Uh, and when John Carter leaves the the location where he met Rappus, he spots an assassin waiting to kill him. So this is it's attempt number two by the Assassin's Guild to do away with him. Um, and as I mentioned, this this chapter really amps up the stakes here because now Val Civis is not just a mad scientist with a ship. He's a guy who might someday be able to conquer all of Barsoom. And he's not someone you want to have leading the entire planet. He's definitely not. Uh, comments from you guys? Well, little does he know that he's talking to the warlord of Mars there. Mm -hmm. and he could be writing his own uh, his own uh, jail jail sentence. <laughs> yeah, like, he's, lucky, he's lucky it's all he would get. Mm -hmm. Johnny, those things are, are settled with the sword. Yeah. So, well, it's it's all going to come back to bite him eventually. So, um, 
Well, uh, chapter eight, which is titled Suspicion. Um, he meets the assassin, whose name is Povak, and even tells him that, hey, I'm John Carter. But Povak doesn't believe him until he until during the fight he carves a little X in his 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 breast before he kills him. Um so back at Val, he goes back to Val Civis's house. Xanda tells him that she hates John Carter because he's responsible for her parents' death during the Battle of Zodanga. This is back at the end of Princess of Mars. The Zodangans had conquered, had captured Dejah Thoris and were also invading Helium. And John Carter organized the Green Men of Mars to attack Zodanga and raise the city and uh, turn the table on them. So her parents were killed during that incident. Um, and so she just, you know, hopes one day to meet John Carter so she can kill him. Um, you know, so uh, Hamas, in the meantime, reports that he saw Bandar, John Carter, with Rapis. Um, you know, and Val Civis, Val Civis, you know, asked Bandor or John, why you didn't kill him? Like, I ordered you to kill Rapis. How come you didn't? And John Carter replies that Rapis has connections with her Jan that require further investigation. You know, so he just... Off the top of his head, he makes up with a reasonable explanation for why he didn't kill Rappus. That night, he meets with Rappus again, um, and Rappus just, he's starting to get suspicious too. He just says it's weird that Povak was killed with the mark of John Carter, you know, right after they parted the night before. So people are starting to, I think, suspect that Vandor might be John Carter. Um, but I do enjoy how John Carter keeps his head in situations such as, you know, Xanda saying she wants to kill John Carter without realizing she's speaking to him, or when he's confronted about not killing Rappus, he keeps his head and he comes up with, he thinks it through off the cuff, coming up with explanations for why he's behaving the way he is, that keeps him in, uh, that keeps the bad guys from realizing who he really is. Um, comments from you guys? Nothing from me. Okay. I, uh, it's, it's a, uh, I don't want to use the word trope because it makes it sound too generic mm -hmm. but uh it's kind of like a trademark or a signature and uh a lot a lot of stories are like whether it's a zorro or it might be pirate stories where someone might complain to don diego i hate zorro for what he's done to this land or mm -hmm. to, to my family and they don't realize it's zorro though and he's actually been don diego's actually zorro and helping them or in some of the other borough books where someone doesn't realize person's real identity or the prisoner is then done, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It can be done very successfully and 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 can make for a great uh, um, plot twist or complication mm -hmm. in the relationship between people because you're going to figure out how is this going to be resolved. And most of the stories I like it resolves itself nicely, but, you know, the romantic in me. But uh, there are other ones where, you know, one person ends up killing the other person to end the story or the movie or the book or whatever and, and so I'll always find when you get in a situation like this that Burroughs uh, wrote it up very nicely and and holding it very tightly that this is something that has to be resolved but mm -hmm. uh John Carter isn't going to jump the ship not, mm -hmm. not. yeah but, but but the the thing though I think that bothers me it just it's it's easy to have that you know the hindsight's 2020 I have to remember that but but John Carter's going around dispatching people and using his little emblem so he's, he's sending a message that, hey, John Carter's in town. Mm -hmm. And now people start wondering, oh, gee whiz, who is John Carter? Where is this guy? And and they start looking at the new fellow and wondering, where did he come from? And who is he really? So he really should not be surprised at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course, remember, he's wearing the red pigment on his skin, which, you know, at least, uh, you know, John Carter, well, everybody's thinking, well, John Carter has white skin. And this guy's red skin, so okay, you know, yeah, that's uh, true. But they also know that it's, they, these pigments exist, so they could think, oh, it could be a disguise. So, but it's it's at least it's one more little block in between them fully realizing that Vandor must be John Carter. Well, if so, someone he, walks up to John Carter, says rubbing his nose, he might want to back off and get get that to mm -hmm. get straightened out before they find out his nose is not red. Yeah. I think he can argue at this point he knows he's going to be outed as John Carter eventually, but he's just going to play this part as long as he can. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. He knows he's going to be found out like when he admitted who he was to the, to the, during the fight with the one guy and he almost did before, whether that's some ego or to put those, uh, same with the Z on Marco Zorro and other movies, Robin Hood or whatever, or books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
it leaves a feeling of terror for the people like is the warlord here mm -hmm. where is he yeah he a phantom and he's mm -hmm. creating a panic among the people and they might start and that's when they start uh disassociating or maybe turning uh information over on someone else in order to protect themselves mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense so okay uh chapter nine it's just cool it's just cool <laughs> yeah it is cool so uh chapter nine on the balcony um so he's you know john, john carter continues to show that he's quick on his feet and he thinks things through um he takes supper with rapus and then he gives the slip to a couple more assassins and he takes his flyer to the headquarters of uh, the building of the assassins guild and he climbs down a rope to a balcony outside the meeting room and he discovers from what he overhears that they are planning to kidnap dejah thoris and hide her on the moon thuria and they can do this because gal gar now who is the rival uh, inventor uh, has finished his interplanetary ship so carter now suddenly he has to rescue he has to stop the assassins he has to foil val silvis val silvis eventually now he also has to make sure his wife's not kidnapped um but while he's climbing back up he makes a noise and it looks like he's caught that's a cliffhanger ending to the chapter um but he just, you know, ERB, he just, Burroughs keeps incre increasing the threat level. As, as I just said, first he's after Zadagan assassins. Next, he has to deal with Pal Civis. Then he finds out that Pal Civis might be a threat to the world. Now he finds out that Garnal has a ship as well and that Dejah Thoris is in danger. So if it's not one thing, it's another. You know, this, the, um, and I think, Scott, you mentioned earlier how well uh, Burroughs keeps the story going so that we understand what's going on at all the time is the exposition here is is excellent he gradually builds up these different threats but we never get confused or lose track of what's going on we mm -hmm. we under we understand that all these plot threads exist and where they are in the story at any one time so comments from you guys well since they have they the bad guys have expressed concern that john carter might be in town Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, Deja Thoris gets prominently mentioned in a, in a possible kidnap attempt. Mm -hmm. Could that be their way? They are the bad guys. Could that be their way of uh, drawing John Carter out into the open? That could be one factor they're considered. I think they also wanted, uh, what, two ships full of ransom, we eventually find out. Yeah. So so I think it's mostly money, but I, one of them could have mentioned in this meeting, hey, this is a good way of getting Carter out into the open, too, if he's here, and maybe we can take care of him. Because so, I was, I would suspect, unless they know he, let me see now, unless, of course, assuming that he's not, doesn't have a, the means to call home, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because they could simply say, the way I envision, they could simply say, we've got Deja Thoris and announce that loudly in the hallway, so make sure it can be heard and repeat it several times so it can be heard. And then, then they just stand, stand back and watch to see who jumps into action. And there goes John Carter down. Yeah. Yeah, that, that actually might have been a factor in their plan beyond the ransom they wanted to charge. So it kind of makes sense. You know, we think Carter's here. He's killing our guys. Um, we need an advantage over him. Oh, let's go kidnap his wife. It does make perfect sense. Now I'm thinking like a villain. I don't know if it's a good thing or not. Yeah. So <laughs> And they also dis they also discussed if if they did catch uh the warlord meantime, well, because they're going to get Deja to Thoris. That's mm -hmm. Uh, uh, non-negotiable they're planning to do that mm -hmm. that they would then be able to hold him for ransom too and kill him afterwards and probably kill her too when she gets there but uh yeah they're talking they said because if we already got carter in custody then we'll just go to uh deja thoris father or family or the empire to have them pay for it mm -hmm. and we'll still get rid of our enemies um yeah i think that those are all good points so um we're all thinking like villains here. So I don't know what it says about all of us. So <laughs> how, how to milk helium of their riches in three easy lessons. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I don't think any of us would stand a chance against John Carter in a sword fight. So it's all beside the point. Anyway, Speak we'll never, yourself. we'll never, but <laughs> 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 so, um, I, I might so, regret saying that. Yeah. You know, if John Carter listens to this, if anybody gridly waves, waves our podcast up to Barsoom, uh, you might have a visitor soon. So, sir, sir, warlord, I, I uh, <laughs> so, 
Okay, so chapter 10, which is called Jat Orr, which is the name of the character we meet in this one. Um, Carter manages to get away while dangling on the rope. It's a neat little action scene. Um, and he, he gets out of Zodanga and flies to Helium because he wants to warn Dejah Thoris of her impending kidnapping. Um, you know, he escapes a patrol boat and he gets to Helium and he meets a young Padwar, which is also a lieutenant named Jat Orr. And he forms. He tells him, "Nope, too late. Dejah Thoris has already been abducted. Um, Tardis Moore and Moore's Kajak, the Dejah's grandfather and father, have sent a thousand ships to looking for her. But Carter grabs Jador as an ally, and they immediately head back to Zodanga because that's John Carter knows where the prisoner princess could be. Um, it is one thing I think of. It is really too bad that Martians technology never invented anything like the radio, because you could, you know." These the, the thousand ships are gone, and you're until they come back in person, you're not necessarily going to hear it from them. So he can't call reinforcements. They've all been sent out to the wrong place. So it's got to be just him and Jat Orr, the only uh, the only forces available at this time. Um, because he really needs to bring some walkie talkies back with him next time he's on Earth. Well, um, I was wondering exactly how big the Helium Air Navy is because a thousand ships to me sounds like quite a few. Yeah, uh, and who who's buying the story helium? Who's guarding it? Yeah, it well, I could see Tardis Moore saying it doesn't matter. We'll defend helium with the with our our housekeepers if we have to. First thing first is we have to rescue Dejah Thor. Send out every ship. Um, okay, I, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I think he would do that. Um, so, um, and that might not be the most rational thing, but I can just see Tardis Moore. That's what he would do. I, well, that's the certain. words of a father or grandfather, either mm -hmm. way. Yeah, yeah, I, I can definitely understand that. Yeah, um, I and will say, <laughs> yeah, and um, I like Jat Orr, and it's nice to meet another heroic Barsoomian, and I know he's also there to be a love interest for Xanda as well, so he serves a purpose in the story. I kind of wish, there's a part of me that wishes like Tars Tarkas or Canthus Can had been there and had partnered up with John Carter for the rest of the story, but um, Jat Orr is a great character in his own right, and he does serve a purpose that those others couldn't. And becoming uh, Zanda, Zanda's uh, boyfriend later on. Well, I certainly have. I, I can uh, understand and agree. I have a admiration for Cantos Can, and it really springs from the um, from the John Carter movie. I forget the actor's name, but the fellow there playing Cantos Can, I thought did an excellent job with the character, mm -hmm. and really should have had the job of playing John Carter, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, I just remember I've... in the. Oh, go ahead, Scott. No, no, that's okay. I'll I can wait. Oh. I just remember in in the movie, and I admit I have my problems with that movie and the and how they did the story. Although visually it was fantastic, uh, I liked Canthos Can for some. They made him kind of a joker, the the smart mouth guy. Right. And even though he's not really that in the books, it seemed to fit him when he did that. I I just thought, oh yeah, that uh, Canthos Can would have would be the smart mouth guy. Um, and well, I don't that know, actor can I have don't, a little smirk on, in his eye. Yeah, I think, yeah. It may be, it it may be just that the actor did it so well. But I just thought, okay, I can see that in Cantos Khan. Even though it's it's not in the books, I was perfectly willing to accept it. And it's probably the actor playing him who just sold the character. Mm -hmm. And Scott, I interrupted you about oh, something. Yeah, well, well, I interrupted you. <laughs> no yeah, so, uh, I have two things. First observation is uh, I have always wondered if the term... Padawan and Star Wars came from Padwar being used here in uh, uh by um, Edgar Rice Burroughs and uh sort short of answer homage or or inspired by that the short and, answer is yes mm -hmm. yeah I'm thinking because yeah they're like uh they're in training not necessarily lieutenants but they're in training under Jedi forces and stuff the other one is I, I want to see this scene in a movie with him hanging onto that rope and flying around the city. I know similar things have been done, Indiana Jones and biplanes mm -hmm. and all that. And you see them more and more now, but this was probably one of the earliest. I, Jules Verne may have done it somewhere in, around the world in 80 days or something, but one of the earliest things where you have a uh, form of a flying machine and the person's hanging on trying to climb back on and control it and get back into a safe area. And also mm -hmm. he mentions specifically that though Carter has advantage over Martians, this is a small rope, a tiny rope. If you've mm -hmm. ever tried to climb up a tiny rope and, <laughs> and not twine, that won't work <laughs> compared to a big, big, thick, heavy knotted rope. Yeah. 
that's going to be very hard to do. Yeah. And that's just an overall cool um, um, action scene. But yeah, that might be a first. That would be, I have no idea how you could research that. Like, it was this the first time somebody's dangling from a rope from a plane in an action scene? Well, um, I, can, I can tell you, though, in Tarzan the Untamed, uh, Tarzan uh, grabs hold of a rope from a plane that's in the process of taking off and is dangling, I don't know, 10 feet, 20 feet below the plane and makes its way up that rope. Oh, that's right. And that's a World War yeah. One novel. So that's uh, like 15, 20, 15 to 20 right. years before this. OK. And then and then the other thing, but before I forget, back to our conversation a moment ago, uh, there are there's a few things I've got a list someplace uh, that were borrowed by Star Wars from the Burroughs books. Another word was Sith. There's a hmm. big, angry bumblebee that John Carter runs into in War Warlord of Mars that he and Willa run into it. And that that bee throws Willa across across the page. Uh, but uh, but that thing is called a Sith. Mm -hmm. okay. So and and uh, Star Wars got borrowed that word. All right, go, go ahead. I'm done. Okay, but no, that's cool. I mean, Star Wars one of the major influences, obviously, um, in Star Wars is is the John is Burroughs. Mm -hmm. You know, Star oh, Wars. Yeah, Star Wars would not exist without Burroughs. Yeah, now, I'm a Star Wars fan too, so it doesn't yeah. bother me. Yeah, no. no, I am as well. So, okay, chapter eleven which is in the house of Garnell. So um, the just, you know, Carter goes, he, he gets back to Zodanga um, and he gets to back to Val Sivis's house. Um, and uh, he learns where Garnell keeps his interplanetary ship. And he hears a sob in the next run, but the next room, but he's not able to investigate. And then he finds out that Xanda is missing. Um, so, but but he's like still leaves on his his mission to go to Garnell's hangar, but um, uh, when he's there, there's a noisy accident that brings a couple of guards. He kills one, and he gets information from the other that Garnell's ship has picked up someone near helium, and he knows that would be Dejah Dej Thoris, and then he's proceeded to Thuria, so he's headed off for the moon. Um, Carter tells J Jat Orr to take their flyer west and to wait for him. Um, He's, his plan obviously is to get Val Sivis's ship, pick up Jat, uh, pick up um, Jat Or, and then head for Thuria to to rescue uh, Dejah Thoris. Um, I do have to say there are occasions when John Carter is a little dense. You know, Zan does not in his room, and he hears a sob behind the door in the in Val Sivis's lab, but he doesn't make the connection there. Um, but he's always he's always been a little bit dense when regards to women. Sometimes anyway. Um, <laughs> But the, the pacing in this chapter really picks up. This is a fast paced, you know, he's John Carter goes from one location to another. He's improvising plans as he goes. He has a sword duel against two men. This is like this is where the the um, the novel, which has moved along at a fast pace and had action scenes. But this is where it really kicks into overdrive, I think, with this chapter. Uh, comments from you guys. Yeah, I. Uh... I don't know why he doesn't check the doorway. Here's the sob. Yeah. <laughs> don't and, well, I, I think maybe we can excuse him. He's anxious to get after Dejah Thoris, and that's going to be yeah. in the forefront. So he's going to have a, that he's laser focusing on that. Um, I suppose we can't be too critical of him, but it just seemed like an awful uh, obvious connection to make. Well, actually thinking about that, Burroughs is going to tell us, us the reader stuff we need to know. Yeah. So if Burroughs says someone is sobbing, that really ought to be investigated. Mm -hmm. So if John Carter's reading the book, he he should he should then know. Man, I should <laughs> look into that. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna he's going to proofread what Burroughs wrote later on and think, okay, I messed up. So, but it's kind of neat that um, I mean he's going to make kind of a mistake with the spaceship and not telling it to stop next to a tower later on. So oh yeah. It's I think it's nice that. You know, Burroughs' heroes are super capable, heroic people, but they can occasionally goof. And I think that makes them more human because of that. He gives them humanity. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Good point. Because yeah. yeah, he didn't have to put that line in there about hearing the sob. Yeah. So I, I got to assume it's intentional for whatever reason. Yeah, it's foreshadowing. And you, maybe you can argue, yes, this is part of John Carter's character that he's laser focusing on Deja and he's uh -huh. the other stuff's not going to occur to him when normally it should. 
So, so you could just, you could argue it's in character. I was kind of making fun of him a minute ago, but you know, this is probably in character for John Carter. You put Deja. You better hope he isn't listening to this broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you listen, he's, now he's got reason to come down and confront at least two of us. Jess so, is the only one safe right you're now. The only, you're the only one safe, Jess. Be careful what you say for the rest of the podcast. Or you'll be on his list too. Oh, I'll blow up before the night's over. I guarantee. You. Okay. <laughs> the next wave has a far reach. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, chapter twelve, which is titled "We Both We We Must Both Die." So, uh, um, Rapus, you know, tells Vandor or John Carter that that, that Deja has been kidnapped by Earth Fan, and the ransom is two shiploads of treasure. Um, you know, so he he knows that Earth Fan and Rapus are sending him this message this way. You know, they're still pretending they don't know he's John Carter, and it's obvious to him now that they finally figured it out. So uh, uh, Carter tells about Fal Sivis that Earthan and Garnal are already on their way to Thuria. Um, the moon is seven miles in diameter, and um, I, it's either at this point or later on that uh, uh, John Carter, yeah, Val, it's here that Fal Sivis tells Carter of the theory of compensatory adjustment of masses. So when you fly from Mars to Thuria, you shrink down so that it seems like a planet when you're there and the gravity is the same and all of that. When you fly from Thuria to Mars, you revert to your original size. And we talked about that earlier with the interdimensional possibilities of it. But um, however it works, it's kind of a cool little thing that allows Burroughs to tell the story he wants to tell. Um, you know, and so the as the chapter ends, John Carter hears a scream from the next room. He remember he's back in Fal Sivis's laboratory. He finds Xanda about to uh, undergo brain surgery. So Carter frees her, and Fal Sivis runs to get help. He now knows that Carter has turned against him as well. So um, uh, John Carter is kind of burning his bridges uh, in Z Zodanga here, but it doesn't matter. He needs to get the ship, and he needs to get after Deja Thoris, and that's that's the only thing he's going to do. This is another very exciting and well um well a fast-paced chapter and i like we had fun talking about the possibilities you know interdimensional gateways and all for how it works when you go to thuria but i kind of like that burroughs just introduces the idea and said that that's the way it works and he doesn't try to techno babble it he just says that's the way it is run with it and enjoy the story hey it worked when he sent john carter to mars um, mm -hmm. waking up after dying so yeah yeah so, so there are mysteries on Mars that he doesn't bother explaining, and I think it's just as well. It adds to the ambiance of the series. I, I like this phrase, compensatory adjustment of masses, and just the heck of it, I did a Google on it. Mm. I don't see where real science has used that phrase yet, but I think it deserves purpose. <laughs> oh, it would have been interesting if Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon and they were only like one-sixth of their size when they normally were. Um <laughs> That would have well, been then NASA would have had this term ready to go. They yeah, they would have had that. Yeah, yeah, they would have. Oh, wait a minute. To the, Burroughs was the yeah, Burroughs was right. I mean, you've seen the Ray Brad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like um I don't know. Would we have even noticed though if we were watching the Armstrong on television? Um we we would um, of course he would have noticed that the gravity was earth like from his point of view. So, well, the, the third guy in the Apollo capsule that was still orbiting the moon while Armstrong and Aldrin were down were down on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, Collins, Michael Collins is Michael was. Collins. Yeah, if he'd had if he'd had a telescope and he was scanning, which is not the case, but if he if he'd had a telescope scanning the lunar surface and and looking in the direction of where uh, Armstrong and Collins uh, Armstrong and Aldrin would be, uh, then. Uh, if he realizes that he has to put super magnify on his telescope in order to see them, that would suggest there's some, there's some, uh, what is it, the adjustment of masses of contemporary uh, compensatory stuff here going on. Never mind. I that. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. Time to be quiet. But there. anyway, uh, but it, it, uh, Fal Sivis says that it's a, a special relationship between Barsoom and Thuria. So it doesn't happen on any other satellites elsewhere in the solar system. It's just this one spot. For so this whatever is reason. Made. It's I have a, I have experienced this compensatory adjustment of masses on Earth here. Because when I was like 16, I went to ask a pretty girl for dance to dance with her at homecoming. She turned around and looked, dance with you? Are you kidding? And I turned around and I was about 12 inches high. <laughs> oh man, that's painful. 
That is. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, have you ever wandered into a room mm -hmm. and then forgot why you're in that room? Yeah. You know what happened is that you were abducted by aliens for about three hours. <laughs> that's, the, that's a good excuse. I like that. I'm going to use that next time I, I forget something and Angela points it out. Oh, that explains the holes in my timeline. Yes. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if Angela would fall for that if I used it. I mean, I tried to tell her I was late getting back from picking up my nephew last week because we were attacked by an Allosaurus on the way home. Um, so I think I've used up my likely stories with her over the years. I, I found creative <laughs> excuses. Back when I was married, I found creative excuses always worked for me. <laughs> so kind of into the okay. conversation right there. Yeah. So okay, so chapter 13, pursued. Um, so uh, you know, the, the, he rescues Xanda. There's some other girls there who have already had their brains worked on, and they're only the only thing to do is to mercy kill them. Which Xanda takes John Carter's dagger and does that work. Um, um, you know, Carter, John Carter specifically says, "I would have if I've had to, but I'm glad somebody else did it because this was highly unpleasant." Um, so. Uh, Falcivus returns along with several of his uh, minions, including Hamas, and uh, Carter kills one of them. Um, the, uh, in fact, a guy, a, a slave named Woolock, who it mentions in the summary here that he lasts one page in the story. He shows up, hi, my name's Woolock, and then he gets killed. So um, uh, Xanda, who once again, Burroughs' women's are, women are awesome. She throws something at Falcivus and knocks him out. Um and the others just throw down their sword because they're cowards. And Carter ties them up and he gags them. And he go, uh, um, he just starts to use the thoughts, uh, the his thoughts to control the ship. So he and Xanda take off in the ship. And Xanda tells John Carter that he'll be his, she'll be his slave forever and that she loves him. You yeah. know, and he's telling her, no, you don't have to be a slave anymore. You're free. And she's saying, nope, I love you, I want to be your slave forever, which for a, you know, a married man who's faithful to his wife is a very annoying situation. Um, <laughs> but the chapter ends um, with, with a patrol boat coming for them. Um, so that is pursued. And once again, that mercy killing scene was pretty gruesome. Um, and I like that John Carter founded a repugnant idea, even though he knew there was no other choice. And I think Xanda being willing to do it doesn't mark her as being cruel or heartless. I think she found a degree of moral strength there in putting these women out of their suffering when there was no when there was no way to save them. Um, there's a, a little bit of dark humor in the scene when the bad guys are telling each other to be the first through the door to go to attack John Carter. Nobody wants to face him first. And the, there's a pretty epic sword fight in there. And once again, Xanda demonstrates just how capable Burroughs women are when she knocks out Falcibus. Uh, comments from you guys? Well, well when Xanda is expressing her affections for John Carter, I don't guess there's any sobs we hear coming out of the background any place, is there? No, no. I think they've they've uh, um, rescued or mercy killed everybody involved by this point. Okay, just one yeah. check. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, did um, he leave anybody behind? Yeah. So, yeah. The, the part about this whole called mercy killing. We're used to seeing people make their own decisions to sacrifice themselves for others. But this was a edgy topic mm -hmm. at any time, including today, much less when he wrote this story in the 30s uh, of uh, killing someone because it's more merciful for me. You, you see it sometimes in biblical uh, spectaculars on the big screen and things like that. But it, it's a pretty edgy topic on is that right or not right? And the whole, I, you know, I'm not going to get into any of the other physical or uh, political statements or anything on it, but it's a, it's quite a controversial uh, position to put his character in in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, that's, that's a very good point. You know, the uh, putting them out of their misery, so to speak. And and the question is, is someone going to be asking questions about this during some investigation later on? How are we going to address that? Well, does uh, does John Carter as being warlord of Mars? Um, I don't know. They they probably don't. Nothing in whatever Martian constitution they have talks about the right to mercy kill. But um, you might explain it to their families, and they might they might actually say thank you for making their deaths easier when they were suffering horribly. So, 
Um, Although they just got done killing a bunch of people in the room anyway. Yeah. So, uh, no, but it's a good point. It is an edgy topic. The story, I think, handles it well in treating it as a very grim and repugnant thing. I think Carter's attitude is, we have to do this. There's no other choice. But it you, you can debate that. You can open it up to the, to the more, you know, uh, Carter was doing something he honestly thought was the right thing or allowing it to be done. Um, but um, there's room to argue about what the correct moral choice here was, obviously, just as there is today with with the idea of mercy killing or assisted suicides and all of that. Then we need to remember that Xander was in this position, mm -hmm. almost totally in this position. Yeah. So her thoughts and fears of would someone please kill me now before Carter rescued her probably is translating to this, that. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I said earlier that it's bone chilling when they described lifting the skull off to work on the brain and stuff. And these people are alive and, and suffering and all that. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's a pretty tough scene. That is. Um, and it, it, it's too bad, once again, that they don't have long distance communication. They could have called in the <laughs> mad. Who was the scientist from Mastermind of Mars who perfected brain surgery and brain transplants? Maybe he could have Rest done something. Davis. Rest Davis. Maybe he could have done something. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but there's no way, you know, he was in another part of Mars altogether. So there was, he wasn't handy. So, I don't think he makes house calls. He probably doesn't. So, <laughs> so yeah. So um, anyway, it is, it does open an interesting moral debate here. If the book, it's not the main point of the book, but Burroughs handles it with enough gravitas to where, you know, he just doesn't shrug it off. So it, he handles it well, I think. And it does open up if you wanted to dive into it, it opens up the debate of the morality of it and what the right thing to do would have been. So well, re re real quick, partly because uh, so we can move on also because I'm speaking from memory. So my facts may not be quite accurate, but uh, this topic of, of possible mercy killing, I'm going to underline the word possible because I'm not sure what, what happened there uh, or would have arisen in the uh, monster men book. That is, that hmm. is the characters that, uh, Oh heck that one scientist, um, created uh, uh, trying to trying to create a perfect human being. He's mm -hmm. going to his daughter off to one of them. Yeah, those uh, number created, number numbers one through thirteen. Those that's guys. That's exactly right. Yeah, they yeah. they had several creatures who were, who were in pitiful shapes. Some of them. Mm -hmm. and I, I I distinctly recall because I was quite fond of the way the conversation was handled, where one of the sci scientists uh, confronts uh the the head scientist saying what are you going to do about this and the head scientist says it's not my problem and the other guy says you created these creatures mm -hmm. they need your guidance they, they they need to be taken care of something needs to be done with those this is a, it's a good ethical question and discussion is what, is. Do you, what do you do with these poor things mm -hmm. right, that's all i just want i just wanted to mention that exactly right, how so. it turned out i'd have to go back and review the book yeah but uh, it's it's a good question to ask that's a good parallel so um Okay, well, chapter 14 is on to Thuria. Um, they were being chased at the end of chapter 13. They were being chased by a, a patrol boat. There's no problem getting away because they can do uh, 1,350 hods an hour, which is a Barsoomian mile. So I can't remember the conversion there, well, how many hods per mile, but they're doing like 1,000 miles per hour um, or more. So um, uh, uh, Carter... Uh, it, he mentions that when he's controlling this thing, he feels like he's in the power of some soulless Frankenstein. Uh, I think, Jess, you mentioned earlier that they referenced mm -hmm. Frankenstein, but it's perfectly reasonable that John Carter would know about Frankenstein because that was written uh, 50 years before his first visit to Mars. So they meet Jat Orr, who's waiting at the rendezvous point. They send the flyer back to helium on autopilot, and Jat Orr comes ash ash um, ashore comes aboard and they have some misgivings and some some conjectures about how this mechanical brain might be used for evil uh as they take off for thuria and um this is you know this this is like the uh, the conversation they have about is this mechanical brain a good thing will it like take over will it do things on its own will it act morally or immorally if it does these conversations, it's almost exactly sounded like a modern day conversation about AI that people are having now. Mm -hmm. um, it just, and I love that. I don't think Carter was predicting the future or trying to predict the future, but it's just kind of fascinating how, um, how he was raising concerns about this mechanical brain that reflect 
so exactly concerns people are having today over artificial intelligence? Well, it's not unusual for science uh, fiction to, to mirror science fact or vice mm -hmm. versa. There. Yeah. And yeah. In fact, it's one of the benefits of science fiction is to begin asking those very kinds of questions because someday it may be a real issue. Yeah. People are thinking about it. And mm -hmm. regarding AI, I, I, I was, uh, oh, heck, I've been uh, refreshing my memory on the uh, Terminator series, mm -hmm. several films there, some better than others. But uh, that's basically what that's about is, is artificial intelligence and the possible wrong turns it might take in the, in the name of, of progress or the name of mm -hmm. protection or, or whatever excuse that machine might use to kill everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but now talking about real life science, I think when they suddenly speed up to what, you know, 1,350 miles per hour, I, I don't think that Burroughs thought about G forces at all when he was describing how quickly the ship speeds up. Um, so, uh, in universe, I think we can presume that Martian science has a way of counteracting or blocking G-force in, in ships like this. Otherwise, they would have all been mushed against the back of the plane as soon as as soon as soon John Carter told the ship to go full speed. Well, here's <laughs> where I'm lacking physics, and I really ought to know this. But off the top of my head, um, uh, gravity might play into this. Mm -hmm. So between planets who don't have a whole lot of gravity might be one set of conditions. But as you near another planet and their gravity comes begins to come into play, um, then that might affect the that might that might modify the effect of these G forces. You're right about G forces, but then mm -hmm. that could come into it. And then you've got theory and whatever's going on there with the shrinking with the shrinking people thing. Yeah. Uh, who knows how gra gravity works there? That's so, true. I mean that and that's fair enough by itself. But I'm, I'm pretty sure in real life, G-forces act on you even if you're in a weightless environment or a low gravity environment. But then I'm not a physicist and I'm remembering science fiction stories rather than any real physics I've read. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, so I'm I could be wrong. I'm falling victim to science fiction too. I, yeah. I shouldn't use that phrase. Yeah, but, uh, I know. I've read hard science fiction where they have they simulate gravity on their ships by just accelerating at one G as they travel from one planet to another. Sure. So, you know, and these are hard science fiction writers who have supposedly done the math. So I'm kind of trusting them on this. Mm -hmm. So, so I think John Carter, Carter and the others should have felt G forces when they suddenly speed up to like a thousands of miles, you know, over a thousand miles per hour. Okay. So, so we can just say, well, Martian science has compensated for that. So yeah, works for me. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, on Star Trek, they whenever they say Heisenberg compensators, that's what they're um that's what they're talking about is why they don't get smushed against the walls whenever they go to warp speed. So at, at least on next generation, they learn to nail the chairs to the floor. Whereas mm. in the series, <laughs> those chairs would topple over and people went flying. But they still haven't invented seat belts. Seat belt technologies was <laughs> seat belt technologies were lost after the 21st century and not and not recreate <laughs> so. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I've always imagined in the original Enterprise, Kirk said, we don't need seatbelts. That's not cool. And I'm the coolest <laughs> looking captain. So, okay, where are we? We are in chapter 15, Thuria. So the mechanical brain figures out the correct trajectory to arrive on Thuria. And um, they actually talk about this for a minute. Uh, you know, they look like they look out and they don't see Thuria in front of them. And they're briefly afraid that they're on the wrong course. And then they realize, no, wait a minute, the brain knows what it's doing. It's on an intercept course with Thuria. It will be there when we get there. And that theory of compensatory adjustment of masses takes effect so that they are um, of, the, of the proportional size when they land on Thuria. So the gravity is no different than if they were on, uh, on Barsoom. Um, you know, so uh, John Carter tells Xanda she's a free woman and he assigns Jat Orr as her protector. I don't know if he was deliberately doing some matchmaking there to keep Xanda from keep staying in love with him or what. But they arrive on Thuria. They wait for uh, morning to arrive. They're wondering how they're going to find Garnell's ship. But then Xanda has the chapter in. Xanda sees something. Um, so... Once again, I think I've already mentioned that I just like that Burroughs does the compensatory adjustment of masses thing without trying to techno babble it too much. He just tells us that's the way it is. 
And now he has an opportunity to do some more world building by taking us to what is effectively another world. So comments from you guys? Maybe that adjustment of masses is related somehow to lower G-forces. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. We can put it all together. So, um, yeah, somebody can figure out all the math of Burroughs physics and and do a PhD doctor, do, doctoral thesis on it. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, in, in real life, I suppose it would be a silly thing, but in Burroughs' story, it fits in nicely and it's not silly and it just, it's the way it works. It's the way when you fly from Barsoom to Thuria, that's what happens. One of the mysteries of space. One of the mysteries of space. So any other comments on this chapter? Not for me. Mm, no. Okay. So chapter 16, they, they see a, a castle. And they see Garnell's ship in the inside the courtyard of this castle. And they land next to it. Xanda dresses by a, like, like a warrior. And she persuades the guys to take her on the adventure. Um, and the, the, uh, they don't see anybody about. And C John Carter inspects the other ship. It's deserted. They all feel like they're being watched. And then they hear Dejah Thoris yelling from somewhere, escape my sheep then. And then they're suddenly all captured by invisible beings. Um, and it seems doomed, but John Carter says a, sends a thought signal to their ship to have it lift off and hover where it will be safe from the bad guys until until they can get to it. Um, so this is the second Martian book in a row that features invisibility as a plot point, because in The Fighting Men of Mars, there's a scientist that had invaded, invented a paint that makes things invisible. Um, so then there's invisibility, uh, then there's this a castle full of people, this nation where they can make themselves telepathically invisible, we'll find out. And then there's yeah. more There's more invisibility in a later book. Lana of Gathol has an invisible race. So, didn't, didn't, didn't John Carter have an invisible cloak, or am I thinking of another story? I think you're thinking of the guy in Fighting Man of Mars. Okay. Um, or it might have been Lana of Gathol had a, had a race of invisible people, but I can't remember the circumstances, the details of it. So um, it might have been that one. Okay, but I think I think that was Fighting Man of Mars, um, and that was related to the paint that uh, made people invisible. So, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a, like a cloak that had that paint on it, but that might be completely wrong. Uh, but there's a lot of invisibility. I'm just kind of embarrassed for Earth scientists that they haven't invented invisibility yet. When there's all these different methods they're coming up on on Mars and on Thuria for how to turn invisible, so. Um, any other comments? I was I would say Barsoom got the invisibility scientist and the mm -hmm. Earth got the um, what the stealth scientist or something yeah. like. That. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, I also kind of like that he just hints at Deja Thoris being nearby by her yelling out "Escape, my chief!" Then it's kind of in character yeah. for Deja Thoris that her first concern would be John Carter's safety. She doesn't yell out, I'm here, rescue me. She's saying, nope, you're going to be trapped. Get away, save yourself. You know, And of course, he's not going to save himself. He's going to stay till he rescues her. But that's what Deja Thoris would do. She would be concerned about John Carter first above herself. You know, I also got to give props to Burroughs on this where it's either like a cloak or a paint or lotion, something that's creating this invisibility. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, H.G. Wells and the Invisible Man, if you're truly physically invisible, one, you couldn't have any clothes on, and two, you'd be blind because the back of your eyes wouldn't have the black reflector in order for you to see. Mm -hmm. um, so here they can be dressed as warriors or whatever. They're just not being seen. That They're invisible by technology, not by a physiological. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a the, like the telepathic um, command of other people not to see them. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is why the good guys are eventually able to beat that once they know what causes it. So, but yeah, that makes sense. I remember um, the Invisible Kid in the Legion of Superheroes from DC Comics, a real early one where he was talking about his origin and, and got a hold of a formula that may let him turn invisible at will. And they actually mention, oh, but then there was the problem of my being able to see while invisible, but we figured that out eventually. And they never explained how. They just acknowledged yeah. it was a problem and then said, no, don't worry, we figured that out. So they saved the techno babble. They, they, yeah. yeah. 
yeah um yeah star trek should have done that more often um i i i love the original series and i like next generation a lot but next generation really overdid techno babble uh, an embarrassingly amount of times they just well as a dc editor down. said if all <laughs> else fails put in a giant gorilla yeah there we go <laughs> they had a few of them they could <laughs> yes so okay so uh chapter 17 is the cat man um they're taken to a throne room and they don't see anybody and they can't see the people holding them prisoner then the return they're 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 taken to separate tower prisons and carter meets a one of the like one of my favorite alien creations now that I was reminded of him because I'd forgotten Very all about cool. him. The Catman, um, you know, Umka the Catman. Uh, one eye, two mouths, um, and he he moves like a cat and he likes to hunt his prey. When they feed him, they just put in this like little winged creature with four legs that he can stalk and kill and eat raw. Um, but it's also somebody for Carter to learn the 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 local language from. Um, so there's a little break in time here where Carter is actually, and his friends are actually prisoners for a while, but it gives Carter a chance to learn the local language. Um, any other comments on chapter 17? I think it's a very cool alien creation. He is. Sort of like a cross between the Cheshire cat and alien. Yeah, he has kind of a creepy, I mean, he turns out to be a friend, but he has a creepy vibe to him, doesn't he? Yeah. So. It's I, amazing. Impression on me when uh, Burroughs uh, ended the statement uh, describing that uh, Catman, uh, quoting John Carter, is not a pretty sight. Mm -hmm. That because that, uh, that that way of communicating something to the reader is is kind of unusual, I think, mm -hmm. and it so it got my attention when I saw that. There was I was, uh, I was thinking that referred to to the fact that Catman played with that alien bird winged creature played with it first like a cat would with its meal and then chomps down on it and yeah eats it. yeah, yeah that's what that's what friend. it was about but yeah. I, th I think what he meant was you know you know the out what the outcome is going to be and if that cat if that cat man character if he decided to turn on one of these people he would do the same kind of thing with them uh so yeah just, i think i think it, her, her fight. yeah yes. i think it helps create them as a th as a possible threat so they make friends with umka and you know he's a friend after a while but when they're captured by umka's people later on they you know they've been established as, as something that can be a threat um so so he kind of kind of uh, burroughs does a great job he has it both ways he introduces someone that we get to know and like as an ally but his people as a whole his species as a whole is something that can be a threat to man um, and he uses that later on. So the, the lesson here is when you're traveling to theory, take some catnip with you. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> or, uh, or a little uh, laser light pointer thing. You can distract him with that. A pipe so, cleaner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well, well, something to keep that animal occupied. Mm -hmm. So chapter 18, condemned to death. So uh, they they do spend some time, several some days in captivity. They don't say exactly how long, but it is does give Carter time to learn uh, the language from Umka, and um, he explains that he the Umka explains that he can see their captors, who are called the Terrans, um, and Umka is a Messina who, um, um, and he suggests that you know there's a mental block that keeps people from seeing the Terrans, but it can be overcome by concentration. You know, they, they've developed, the Terrans have developed this hypnotic power as a protective device. There's only about a thousand of them, and they all live in the castle. And they capture anyone who comes there for, for sacrifice to the sun when the time is right. So uh, Carter concentrates, and eventually he's able to see the Terrans when they come in with food and such. Although he doesn't give away that he can see them. Um, later on, Carter and Umka are taken to the throne room. And Carter's continuing to pretend he can't see anyone. Um, you know, Jack War, Xanda, uh, the bad guys, Urjan and Garnal and Deja Thoris are also there. So everybody from Barsoom is there at the same place at this moment. Um, there, the leader, Ul Vast, there's a man on the throne. He's fat and he's old, and he's got a beautiful wife named Ozara by his side. And um, Carter has a chance to explain to everybody else that it's a hypnotic spell and just practice concentrating and eventually you'll get to see them and um he convinces even uh garnal uh, garnal and urjan to work that they have to work together to escape um 
The Tards, Tards don't know what they're saying because they don't speak Barsoomian. Um, Ozara, though, who proves herself to be very observant, she suspects Carter can see and hear them. So um, Ulvas decides to sacrifice the men to the fire god, and he's going to keep the two women, Xanda and Dejah Thoris, for himself. Um, we, we later learn out he trades queens every once in a while. So uh, Burroughs here in this chapter, he uses a trick that he uses a number of times in, in Tarzan novels, that the hero is a prisoner in a strange land long enough to learn the language. Um, for the And I just wonder something about the native Barsoomians who are with John Carter. The, with the, everybody on Barsoom always speaks the same language. Uh, there's only one language. All cultures have their own written language, but everyone has the same spoken language. This is even in cultures that have been isolated for thousands of years. There's no language drift on Barsoom. The, 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 the language remains the same. So I wonder if this was a really bizarre experience for them on hearing people speak another language, that they even had a concept that there might be another language before this happened. Um, also, I have a personal theory on why language drift doesn't exist on Barsoom, that it might be a side effect of the low level telepathy that red men have on Mars. So, oh. so that no matter how separated they are, they, the, the language always remains the same, uh, even if it's a subconscious use of their telepathy. But for Jat, Jar, Jat Orr and the other Barsoomians, the idea of a different language might have been totally alien to them. Um, and I also like that, you know, we find out Ozara is pretty smart. She picks up on subtle clues that John Carter can now see the Terrids. We don't know if she's a hero or a villain yet, but we know she's smart. So comments from you guys? Well, your uh, notion that uh, uh, the, the telepathy connection mm -hmm. was language, I think that's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always felt because, well, on the Tarzan books, using those as an example, Generally, in most every adventure, if Tarzan's running into someone he doesn't know, there's a moment there to uh, learn the language. There's time there to learn the language and to um, and learn learn a little bit about the customs and the layout of the land, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. before you go off and start resume the, the adventure. Um, I've always felt that the lack of different languages on Barsoom was a convenience thing. Um, that way, Burroughs doesn't have to go through the one or two sentences well, saying that we paused here to learn the vocabulary. I, I, th I think it was a, con a plot convenience. He was creating a, his own world, and he can just say, ah, the language is always the same. Why not? But, but the telepathy thing ties into that beautifully. Mm -hmm. It had been nice if he had actually said that, because mm -hmm. I think it was a missed opportunity for him to point that mm -hmm. out. Go ahead. I was, just, I was just patting you on the back. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, any any yeah, other that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I mean, I think that's a great uh, point to make. Okay. Well, if um, if anybody from Egg Rice Bros Incorporated is listening and wants to fit that into their expanded universe, um, I don't mind my brilliant ideas being shared. Uh, <laughs> also, this is kind of a compressed. Well, it's not a short chapter, but there's a lot that's going on in this chapter. But it doesn't feel rushed, like yeah. it's last minute information. It's mm -hmm. it's one of those we talked about before, hub or turning points where all this stuff's going on now, uh, uh, but it isn't rushed. We know it's over some time, so that everything can be explained in the next chapters of why they're able to do what they can. Yeah, uh, it's the the pacing here is amazing. Even when there's new exposition to be given, and here all of a sudden, Burroughs has to explain what's going on in a brand new world. But it never does feel rushed or it never slows down in order. Oh, we have to, geez, two more pages of exposition. I don't want to have to slog through this. You never get that feeling. He is, is, it just has such a great skill of being able to explain plot points clearly in an interesting manner and without slowing the pacing of the story. Exactly. In some other stories, I have read so much exposition. Mm -hmm. and, and I've just paused to wonder. I wish they'd shoot someone here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then we get back to the exposition. Isn't that terrible for me to say that? No, Speaking it's, it's of assassins. <laughs> um, uh, Raymond Chandler, who wrote, you know, the the Philip Marlowe Private Eye stories, one of the best hard boiled writers. He said, "If you're ever stuck when what happens in your story next, just have somebody walk into the room with a gun." There you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, he's a great writer. He is another one I really like along those lines. Cornell Woolrich. Oh, yeah, Woolrich was brilliant. I, um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of hard-boiled writers out there, well, often contemporaries of Burroughs, who were just doing their own thing and doing it really well. And so, 
Um, but sticking with Burroughs, uh, chapter 19 is entitled Dozira. Um, because uh, the men are just taken to their own prison cell, so they're brought together. Um, in a uh, and the women are placed in a uh, room in what's called the Tower of Diamonds. So, um, Carter explains to everybody else you can see these guys and hear them if you just concentrate for a while. Um, and as they're doing this, it's the, all of them slowly get to the point where they can see the Terrans. But in the meantime, after some days, Carter is taken to Ozera, who's the, the queen. Um, they use the term Jadera, which I just assume is the uh, Thurian language version of the word queen that Burroughs then translates into Barsoomian. Um, so uh, he's led into her presence by Ula, the slave girl, and... John Carter admits to her that he can see her and hear him and explains his mission. And she tells him that she's a prisoner as well here, that she's not from, she's not a native Terrid. She was captured and that the uh, uh, old ass eventually gets tired of his queens and has them sacrificed and gets a new queen. So she wants out of here as well. Um, she's also in the process of falling in love with John Carter too. So, you know, Carter doesn't intend to be a ladies man, but he just manages it no matter what. So, um, so, you know, and at this point, once again, we don't know if she can be trusted. You know, often women who fall in love with John Carter demonstrate their feelings by trying murdering, murdered Deja Thoris. <laughs> so if you've read previous books in this series, at this point, you would wonder, can we trust Ozera? You know, is she going to double cross John Carter out of the bitterness of being rejected? Is she going to try and murder Deja Thoris? Can we trust her? Turns out we can, but we don't know that yet. So, comments from you guys? Nothing from me. Okay. Uh, well, chapter twenty, we attempt escape. Um, so we, um, you know, we, um, she manages to smuggle, or Zara manages to smuggle some a file into the men's room, and uh, she she tells the women in the Tower of Diamonds to hang a red scarf from their window so that they know the men know where they are when they get out. So they they work around. They gradually file away um, the 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 bars on their window. Um, you know, um, and he once again he he talks to Garnal and Earth Jam, the bad guys, and he makes sure that they're in with them. This is a temporary truce until they get away. Um, they are using the file to gradually get their way out. All of them by this kind can time can see the terrors they've done their concentrating and they've gotten past the the mental block of of, of them of not being able to see and hear the terrors so that plot point will be going away soon um so carter mentally summons the ship uh they pull out the bars they they board the ship they have to tie up a couple of terror guards who've gotten caught in the ship when carter sent it up sent it up so many days before they fly over to garnal's ship and he instructs Garnal to follow his ship to the Tower of Diamonds to free the women. Um, the only thing I had written about this in my little plot outline was the escape plan is well thought out of and it's clever. This is good action adventure writing with a plan that makes sense for the situation they're in and with the resources they have. Um, I agree with that. It's, it's sort of, this chapter is sort of lays out a blueprint like, okay, we're getting to the end of the book, mm -hmm. but it's like, is it going to really be this easy? Yeah. we Well, I think we could probably predict that something's going to go wrong at some point. But uh, yeah. but but it's a reasonable plan, and it's well thought out. And it, at first, it seems to be working. So um, uh, I just like, it's just good adventure writing. Um, and it's going to lead. Best plans. Yep. And it's going to lead up to what will be an epic fight scene in the next chapter. Um, so any other comments from this chapter? Not for me. Okay. Well, chapter 21 in the Tower of the Diamonds. <clears throat> so, um, you know, uh, John Carter, he's just, you know, he has misgivings about this plan and he, he knows he has to depend on people, on bad guys that he doesn't know if he can completely trust, but there's nothing to do but go through with it. So he has his ship go past the window uh, to the women and he jumps in. Um, and he, here he makes the mistake of not telling the ship brain telepathically to stop at the window. It keeps going on the course he set when he jumped into the room. So um, he, uh, try, you know, 
he, he's trying to call the ships back as he and his friends are fighting this massive battle in the tower room against the guards. Um, in the end, he gets the ship gets back, but you know time has been lost and reinforcements for the bad guys have come. So um, he manages to get everybody else into the ship, um, but Gar now flees alone with Dejah uh, Thoris in his own ship, and uh, Carter is captured and Ozara doesn't able isn't able to escape either. So most of them are free in John Carter's ship. Gar now it has kidnapped Dejah Thoris and is in his ship. And Ozara and Carter are, are are prisoners of the Terrans. It's just an epic fight scene. And I think we mentioned earlier that I like that John Carter, who's not experienced in commanding the mechanical brain yet, makes the simple mistake of not telling it to telling the ship to stop outside the tower. Uh, you know, it's a nice bit of realism, and it, and it humanizes John Carter quite a bit. So, comments from you guys? No, I agree with your points, but that, that's all I have to say. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah, you know. I, I agree with it too. Uh, and it, it makes for kind of like a funny thing. You're learning to do this stuff, mm -hmm. but you might not remember how where the brakes are. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, um, and and I just got to say again that that the fight scene in the tower is absolutely epic. It is just a wonderfully exciting uh, uh, battle scene. One of uh, and Burroughs always does great battle scenes, but I would I would rate this as one of his best. His narrative of these fight scenes like this are mm. <coughs> always compelling. Yeah, they are. So um, chapter 22 in the dark cell. So he's thrown, John Carter's thrown, thrown into a dark, cold cell. Um, you know, uh, it, it's a grim situation because Garnell has Deja and none of his companions know how to control the other ship. So... The guard who brings him food is is friendly, and he tells him that he's a great swordsman, and it's unfortunate that he's been condemned to death along with Ozera. Um, but Carter just never gives up. He explores the beams above his head. He's able to jump up there because he can still he still has earth muscles, you know he still has that extra proportional strength from being from earth. Um, and he hides up there so when the guard returns, he thinks that Carter has escaped, and. Fool, you know, the guard enters the cell and Carter springs down on him and knocks him out. Um, so I, I like that. I, I kind of like the friendly guard. I'm kind of glad that John Carter didn't have to kill him, just tied him up. Because, you know, the guy the guy wasn't a jerk. He was saying, hey, you're a good swordsman. Too bad you have to die. He's kind of casual about it, but at least he wasn't a jerk. Um, and for his escape, we, you know, we see once again, Carter keeps his head. He checks out his environment and he sees what he can use to his advantage. Um, Escape reminds me a little bit of James Bond played by Sean Connery in Goldfinger, where he just um, paces inside a shell, a, a door with the, where the guard can see him and then lowers himself down and the guard huh. starts to wonder what happened to him until he rather foolishly goes into cell and Bond knocks him out and gets away. So I wonder if John, I wonder if um, James Bond had read the John Carter stories growing up. Yeah. Oh. Very possible, that Ian Fleming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, this was movie Bond, not book Bond. So, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if he did that scene in the book or not. You yeah, know. no, he didn't. He didn't have a comparable scene in the book. Um. Anyway, any comments on this chapter? That was a good chapter. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and at first you're thinking hiding in the beams. How does he do that? But he has the strength of power on Mars to move differently. And uh, what was it, a year or two ago, they did a, uh, uh, all over the news, a video of that inmate who escaped out east mm -hmm. by uh, 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 walking up the walls with his feet and hands and stuff, <laughs> which is not the exact same thing, but things like these can be done. Yeah. And the the, the, <laughs> wall, the wall beams were too high up for a normal... Uh, Thurian or Barsoomian to be able to jump up there. You know, Carter was yeah. able to do it for me. Was on, he was on Earth from Earth, but the Thurians would have no reason. The Terrans would have no reason to suspect him to be able to do that. So exactly. Well, and, and Princess of Mars. Um, let's see, John Carter. I know he has Wola, and mm -hmm. uh, Thoris is there. She's been taken prisoner this, with the Green Martians. Uh, Carter is exploring one night, and doesn't he jump up to a, an area? It, it's not in a religious. Uh, 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 place, but 
it, it kind of gives me that impression. He jumps, he jumps up someplace and he's caught by the, um, he's, he's caught by the green Martians. Uh, yeah. I think, I think he's trying to still, ex he's making friends with Willa, but he's still experimenting. If he can get away, he jumps up to a second floor building where I think mm -hmm. he actually runs into a couple of white apes. That might be. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I'm remembering we, it correctly. At the uh, uh, Mangani gathering a couple of weeks ago, one of the presentations I'm, I'm remembering as being by Pat Quilter, mm -hmm. uh, did a video where he showed extreme sports or like, uh, is it parquetting and stuff, uh, where they're d jumping from building to steps to uh, gymnastic equipment and all that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And he ran all these videos, like uh, descriptions by Burroughs, could Tarzan or John Carter do that? Mm -hmm. And you watch these videos, it's like, yeah, yeah, they could because of normal Earth people or <laughs> <laughs> people we see in YouTube videos and stuff can do these flips and jump and climb up sides of buildings and stuff by their training. Yeah, Carter and, and uh, Tarzan in their enhanced performance modes could definitely do things that, that uh, Bros is describing in uh, short bursts, maybe not 24 hours a day, but it was, it was, a, it was a fun presentation. It's pretty incredible watching what some of these people have grown up learning to do and the fitness, the shape they're in. That's cool. So any of those would probably do quite well on Barsoom with the reduced gravity. So, they would really do good. Mm -hmm. So, okay, chapter 23, The Secret Door. Um, so John Carter's escaping. He locks the guard in his cell. And once again, this was the friendly guard. So I'm glad he didn't have to kill the guy. Um, so he's got weapons now that he's taken from the guard. Uh, he runs into a woman on the way down, but this proves to be Ula, the slave of Azara, um, who wants to help. So she gets some rope and a hook from him because Azara's imprisoned in a room directly above the one they're in. Um, so that night he climbs up to Azara's room. He does his you know, grappling hook to get up there. And they both return to the rooms below. And Azara knows about a secret door that leads to the river and then to freedom. And she's glad that Dejah Thoris is gone for she now has him all to herself. Um, and they're, they're discovered on the way to the door, and Carter uh, just once again has to fight people off as they make a getaway. Um, and the chapter ends with them getting through the door and springing into the river together. Um, so this is another another action-packed chapter. You know, th this is just how good ERB was at writing adventure fiction. This is really fun stuff in this chapter. Um, I will say that Ozara... Um, at this point, she's kind of glad Dejah Thoris is gone, but she's in the next chapter, she's going to learn that John Carter is loyal to Dejah Thoris. And uh, we learn at this point that she is an honorable person. Um, and she's not going to, you know, she's going to say, okay, you're taken. I've got to accept that. And she does, which is, which is cool of her. And that, you know, John Carter must be tired of women who fall in love with him who try and kill um, his wife. You know, I know that all the women I've had to fend off from killing Angela because they've, 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 um, you know, you know, fallen in love with me. That gets just tiresome and time consuming. So, um, it's kind of to, to makes it easier on John Carter when Ozara proves to be a good person. So, any other comments on this chapter? Well, John Carter could have worse problems. He could, yeah. So, I, I was thinking, I was thinking in terms of poor um, Ozara. This. This chapter twenty three might have been the highlight of her life. Mm -hmm. Being well, close to her there for just a little bit, I mean. Yeah, because um, yeah, she's he's got her in his arms when he jumps into the river, and that's as close as he's gonna, uh, gonna get. But that was probably a nice moment for her. So um, anyway, last chapter. Lots of stuff happens in this chapter. Uh, you know, Carter and Ozara enter the forest. There, there's lots of carnivorous beasts here, which are never really described. Um, if um, the expanded universe ever goes back to Thuria, there's room for actually creating these various beasts in detail. Um, but they're they're ch they're chased into a tree. They are captured by Masanas, the the cat people. Um, they're told they're going to be eaten, but Umka is there and saves them, and he sends them to the ship, which is nearby. Um, so, so they're all glad to see him. Even Ur John, the the assassin guild leader, 
he's by this time come to admire John Carter and he swears fealty, fealty to him. He does the Martian thing of putting his sword at John Carter's feet to swear fealty. So he was the bad guy, but now he becomes a good guy. Um, Xanda had learned to control the ship. So that's why she had managed to land it there. And she also by now, even though she never says it, she obviously knows that John Carter, Vandar is John Carter. But she just goes on with the fiction. Well, hello, Vandar. It's a good thing I've never, you know, I've I've never met John Carter because I'm supposed to kill him. So we'll just leave it at that. She's fallen in love with with Jat Or. Um, Ozara's returned to her home nation, where her father is the Jeddak. Um, they learn that Garnell's ship has had become disabled. Um, and um, you know, so um yeah, um but in the end, what, so let's see, Garnell gets back to Barsoom. Uh, John Carter and the others pursue him there. They catch him. He claims that they left Dejah Thoris on Mars, but she manages to get free from where she's being held and come out and say, no, I'm here. Uh, Earl John kills Garnell. Uh, Val Sivis just disappears from the story and reappears in the Will Murray novel years later. Um, and everybody is rescued. So... Um, you know, I do. I will say once again that I like that Ozara turned out to be an honorable person, and Xanda once again proves her worth. You know, once again how good Burroughs handles women. Xanda proves her worth by taking control of the ship when uh, when John Carter wasn't there. Deja Thoris managed to free herself when everybody's back on Barsoom. You know, so the Burroughs women, all three of them, really I think shine in this chapter in different ways, and the story comes to what I think is a very satisfying conclusion. Uh, comments from you guys? Well, I thought it was an interesting twist because it was in chapter two. Um, the first one, I mean, that was a good chapter, I must understand. But in chapter mm. two, uh, Urjan, uh, mm -hmm. John Carter said that his real mission was to uh, uh, take Ursan at, Urjan out of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here at the end of the story, Urjan's uh, pledging loyalty to Carter. I thought yeah. that was an interesting twist. It is an interesting twist. Kind of and I just wonder how they handled disbanding the Assassin's Guild because obviously John Carter would require that to happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I wouldn't think Urjan's men would be happy with that. You know, sorry, I've sworn fealty to our arch enemy who was killing us all. And everybody go home. You know, get a get a job at the 7-Eleven tomorrow or something. Well, and <laughs> that, could, that would certainly be an assignment. <laughs> yeah. Certainly be an assignment for Urjan is to go out there and 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 find something else for these guys to do. They always, always put in the work of guarding helium or something like that. You could, um, but I don't know if you could trust mm. them. These guys did, they weren't showing the same level of honor and uh, loyalty that you normally expect from a Barsoomian. So and I don't know. If they opened up, I, I don't. Yeah, that's where what comes in? Sorry. The sequel. The sequel comes in. Yeah, you you have room for a sequel here for how they handled disbanding the Assassins Guild. You could send them to some remote outpost to stand guard there, but then um, you'd have to have somebody you could trust to watch over. So I'm not sure how you'd handle it. They they opened up a strip mall on the Avenue of Green Throat. There we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, so yeah. So anyway, they, they don't go into that, but we I, we can assume with Urjan swearing fealty to Carter that <laughs> the the Assassins Guild is going to be taken care of. We just we just don't find out how. So. I was surprised that uh, 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 Civis, uh disappeared, but then I figured, well, he's going to hold him up for some other story down the line, just like some of the you know villains, uh, Rakhal mm -hmm. or whatever, and uh, Tarzan and all that. But then Will Murray made use of him. So yeah, I, it might have been that Car uh, Burroughs was thinking maybe I can use this guy again in a story sometime. But then when yeah. he needed a mad scientist in synthetic men of Mars, he used uh, Ross Thavis. So yeah. he, he just never got around to using Falsivis again. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, that made him available for Will Murray's novel, and he was really effectively used there. So Yeah. And everything doesn't always wrap up neatly. We just think at the end, everyone's going to get their comeuppance, but that's mm -hmm. not necessarily so. Yeah. Uh, a, loose, a loose end for a feature story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Scott, you've already said that rereading this has made it your favorite Barsoom novel, even edging it past Chessmen of Mars. I, re I really, yeah, I, you know, sometimes I, I confess, you know, that once in a while you get you're reading a novel and 
you kind of like I uh, zoom through a page or two to kind of get through the stuff. I find mm. my I find myself slowing down on this thing to 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 feed on it to uh, uh, uh suck it all in. It, mm. uh, I I just found it uh, a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I kind of too. It's not my favorite, and um, um, it does take a chapter or two to really pick up. Um, but yes, yes, but uh, but um, it's it was just such a fun novel. I remembered so little of it because I don't think I've read it since probably the eighties. So um, it was like reading a new story, and it was just. I agree. I also had fun and seeing things like you know the the AI connection and things like that in it was, or, you know, the, 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 was just all the more fun. It's kind of fun to read these when we're going to talk about them on the, on the, uh, uh, on the podcast, because then you really have to think about thematic connections and things like that. And it makes it more interesting. Yeah, and he, uh, he really dumped a lot of different elements of stuff. I like, I like the exploration when he's first mm -hmm. introduced the ship and we've seen that in other books, but we did in the last one mm. that we watched that uh, Murray also wrote. Uh, uh, when they were introduced, Tarzan was uh, looking inside the ship and how that was built, and we talked about it. Mm. And the idea of the Assassin's Guild, it had that, uh, which makes sense for, for uh, John Carter, it had that medieval knight and swordsman type thing, you know, mm. going into the enemy's castle and yeah. uh, finding these assassins that are after the royal family and etc cetera, etc cetera, and going undercover it had all those elements that uh combined that uh, i really liked mm -hmm. jess where would you put this amongst the barsoomian novels to like top was, half uh, bottom half or i was just pondering that um well i should i should work up my list i don't want to take time to do that mm -hmm. um I would not put it in the bottom half. Now, mm -hmm. Grant, like you guys, it's been a long time since I've read this story. I knew basically what it was about all along. And I knew about the artwork from it. But I just had not sat down to re read this in years. Um, it, it ranks very well with me. I'm mm -hmm. not going to... Uh, I would put it in the upper half. I'll say this. I would put it in the upper half of the Barsoom novels. But I don't intend to displace anything I've got in front of it. Okay. So, and that is it for Swords of Mars. Um, we have not yet talked about what we're going to do for the next podcast. So I will get with you guys that uh, before long. And um, we can hopefully get, I know we are not able to do these podcasts on a regular basis, but um, um, hopefully we'll get in one or two more before in 2024. And, uh, but I don't know what we're going to be talking about next time. We'll, we'll, um, so we'll figure that out and we'll schedule another recording soon. Um, in the meantime, I thank everybody for watching, or for watching, for listening. Well, there'll be a YouTube of this with various artwork flashing by while you hear our voices, so you can, might be watching it. Um, and just, uh, just thank you all for listening. Thank you for the support we've gotten and having, you know, at least a couple hundred regular listeners, which we appreciate. Uh, please visit our store um, uh, at Cafe Press in the exact. Um, address will be in the notes and you can get all sorts of cool merchandise there with artwork by a friend of mine named Ben Alvarez who's an incredibly talented artist and the ERB Inc. people were kind enough to give us permission to use um, uh, Burroughs images on it so if you've ever needed a Tars Tarkas shot glass well you can get it <laughs> so, <laughs> so and in the meantime my name is Tim DeForest you can visit my blog at comics, comicsradio.blogspot.com uh, where you can also find links to the books I've written. Um, and Jess, you guys want to, you know, you want to plug anything before you go? Well, once again, I'd like to mention my Facebook discussion group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Bros. Please drop by. We've got the uh, G Wiz 20 some odd thousand. I will say 27,000 some odd members where you always got room for more. So, so come on over and let's talk Burroughs for the love of all things Edgar Rice Bros. And this is Scott Stewart and, Thank you for listening. I enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun tonight. Uh, editor of Herb Appa, that's E-R-B-A-P-A. -A. If you type that in on your search engine, we do have, I believe, two, maybe three slots open for membership. We have a limited membership and people uh, write articles quarterly and we publish them and uh, distribute the uh, uh, Herb Appa zine uh, within, within our group. Uh, I'd also like to... Uh, put a, a shout out there to 
uh, the fact that you can go out to uh, ERB Inc. and sign up for their uh, daily offering or weekly offerings of uh, new comic strips. And they, well, they got like well over a dozen strips out there now uh, mm -hmm. concerning Tarzan, Tarzan Twins, Jane, uh, John Carter, uh, just, uh, Outlaw Torn, just a host of a. Uh, uh, ERB stories that uh, you find is very reasonably priced uh, mm. for your subscription. Yeah. Um, I will mention with those strips, I really enjoyed what they've done with uh, The Lost Continent. When they finished adapting the book, they continued the adventures and they've done some time travel stuff. Um, introduced the skeleton men from Mars and the uh, Caldane from Barsoom and tied in the, the, the Orson Welles 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast into it. And it's just a lot of fun. It's um, um, just my particular favorite, I think, of the ones they're doing right now. So, um, but anyway, just uh, thank you both for taking part in the podcast as always. Thank you for everybody who's listening. Uh, don't forget the trivia question um, and send an answer into the proper website to be considered for winning a copy of Tarzan and the Lion Men. And we will see everybody next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>